The following is a presentation of Geekster Media. Hey there, and welcome to the latest episode of the Geekster Geek Out podcast. Now, on this show, we give interesting people who are known for their fandom of a particular corner of pop culture a chance to geek out about another obsession that they're rarely invited to discuss on any other platform. Now, this time around, we are joined by a retro pop culture fan who has been helping us remember the 80s and 90s online for 20 years on his blog, Sludge Central, uh, formerly the Sexy Armpit, uh, for nearly 10 years, and now as co-host of the Purple Stuff podcast, Podcast with Matt from Dinosaur Dracula. We've heard him talk about Masters of the Universe and discontinued sodas and pro wrestling. And although annually we do get his picks for the best Halloween songs, we rarely get to hear about his other musical tastes and fandom. So, Jay, it's time for you to complete the phrase I never get to talk about. Yes! <laughs> the hottest band in the world. Uh, yeah, I'm so excited to be on the show and always an amazing intro from you. So thank you so much for having me. Well, so here's the thing. So we've been able to get together in the past on a couple of my other podcasts that I've done. And I've had you on as a guest and always we take like just a few minutes and we get to talk about Kiss, but we've never been able to go full bore, right? <laughs> into Kiss. Right. Yeah, it's always and I'm, you know, if there's someone else on, it's like, oh, they're on their Kiss thing again, you know, um, but no, it'll be so it'll be so great to, you know, dive in deep. So I'm ready for it. Yeah, so this this is going to be awesome. Uh, so let's just get to the beginning. You and I have talked about this before, but for the benefit of people who are just checking out uh, this topic with us for the first time, what year did you first discover Kiss? And really, what was your first reaction once you saw them? When I was a kid, I think, honestly, it was as far back as I could even remember. Some of my earliest memories are of Kiss, and that is because... When I was a little kid, I was at my neighbor's house up the street and he had all his vinyl albums around on these shelves, like really close to the ceiling on each wall. So he had like Dress to Kill and Alive 2 and specifically those two albums just stuck out at me. And, I, you know, I didn't really even know what I was looking at. I knew nothing about it. Uh, and he explained to me that it's you know, it, it, they're a rock band, you know? Uh, so of course I'm just looking at the pictures I'm like, this is so cool, you know? So um, dressed to kill and alive in alive too. When you see Gene and his bloody face and everything, that's what stuck out to me. It was very vivid. And I was just completely in love from then on. Uh, and then he started showing me, not only did he have the vinyl, but he had the cassette tapes and it, it was not only music, uh, and it looked cool and scary because I love scary things, but it was also collectible. Like there was there was a collectible aspect of it, which always appealed to me, even as a young kid. So that's really what got me into it. So I would say in the very early, early uh, part of my life, I mean, I must have been, like I said, two or three years old, which is just crazy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that that is wild. Yeah, to just to think, just again, the imagery, which I think is what most people even know now. You know, they don't know the music; they know the image of Kiss. Exactly. And yeah, it's either going to turn you off or it's going to fascinate you. And in my case, it definitely was turning me off. I didn't know, like, I had no rock fans. I had no heavy metal fans. Like my brother, he liked like Emerson, Lake, and Palmer, like you yeah. know, progressive yeah. rock from the seventies, like yeah. stuff like that. So it was just like. I didn't, I didn't have that, that exposure. And then I get into high school and I, I, there's this guy who's always coming into my math class and he's always got a kiss shirt on or an Aussie shirt on, you know? And I'm just like, what in, you know, at this moment in time, it's all about Marilyn Manson. It's all about, you know, nine inch nails. It's like this kind of just like grungy, you know, scary music that's coming out in the nineties. And I'm just, I, I just lumped kiss in with them. I'm like, Oh, you know, just some devil worshiper guys. I get how this is. All right. Yeah. And yeah. so I basically like this, this is probably like 90 end of 96, early 97. And then, you know, he's got like kiss t-shirts, but like from the concert that he went to. So he's just like, he heard me talking about it. Cause I'm asking questions. And he's just like, but have you ever actually listened to them? And I'm like, no, I mean, why would I? I mean, at this point, just think about the closest I got to rock and roll was the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles coming out of their shells album. <laughs> <laughs> 
Like that's what I do at rock and roll. Yeah. It's, I mean, still, I mean, that's not, that's not bad. I love that. <laughs> yeah. It's a great way to get going. I mean, but this is even in high school. Like, look, I watched MTV. I knew about Smashing Pumpkins. I knew about Green D. I knew about all this stuff, but I, like, they weren't like my band, right? I didn't have a band. So one day there's a substitute who's just like, guys, I don't care what you do today. Just, just do it. You want to study for another class? You want to just talk? Whatever. And so this guy, his name is Galen. He ended up just bringing in two computer speakers and his disc man that day and the Kiss album Destroyer. And he just, he happened to have them with him. That was all oh, he was like... carrying in his backpack. <laughs> no, that's like, amazing. I'm going to play this for you today and you're going to see what Kiss is all about. And I listened to it and I'm just like, wow okay yeah. i was not expecting like mozart arpeggios and all these different things like in detroit rock city that kicks <laughs> yeah. off the album and then i'm hearing beth which is this just all orchestral ballad and i'm just like i have misjudged these gentlemen i'm gonna have to, <laughs> gonna have to understand more clearly what they're about so we're getting into the summer yeah so it must have been um uh, early 97 going you know mid 97 going into the summer because he's like pope here's what we're gonna do I'm going to give you an album. You're going to listen to this over the summer. We'll talk in the fall. And then you tell me what your thoughts are. Right. And the album he gave me was. Oh, you wanted the best. Yeah. The best. So this, That's this awesome. Kiss had just gotten back together for their reunion tour. Yeah. And this was their collection of live albums, uh, tracks. Like, yeah. Compilation best of. Right. <laughs> He gave me this, and that's the best way to learn about Kiss, a live introduction. But plus, at the end, it had an interview that Jay Leno did with the band members. Right. So I got to know the personalities behind it and the imagery, just everything about it. And so I listened to it like while I'm doing chores all summer, while I'm cutting the grass, you know, I'm listening to Kiss, pulling weeds. I'm just like, oh. And I got hooked and I just started, you know, we'll get into this, but I started going and buying albums before we got to the fall because it got me that much. But yeah, oh, so, I mean, that was the best teacher ever. And also, like, if you're going to get into a band that way, it's Kiss is a great band to like dive into that way. Yeah, like it, it gives you the full breadth of, of what they do. So the question I have for you, though, is. Obviously, you were very young when you're introduced to the band. So how did you first actually start becoming like a fan? Like, where did you get into, okay, well, I'm going to collect this or I'm going to listen to this? Right. Um, so the first time I would start getting like music uh, was from a guy you might know him santa claus yeah so he actually started giving me cassette tapes and you know the albums and everything so that's really like it was the music for even though the imagery sucked me in uh the music really just kept me you know hooked because i as a very young kid i was just so obsessed with music i my parents weren't musicians or anything, but they were also obsessed with music. So we had records and tapes and there was a stereo in every room and, and like there's music on 24 seven, you know, grow, growing up. So for me, just Kiss had this element where uh, it was unlike anything they were listening to, but it was also not to the point where I was listening to like Slayer. So they weren't going to get, you know, too upset, but uh, <laughs> yeah. So it was definitely about the music for me. And I really grew up listening to them. Yeah. It's interesting there because yeah, there are people that I feel like, um, they think of Kiss and they see them as a live act. And a lot of people just know they put on the best live show. And there's a lot of people that just go because they want to see explosions. They want to see lights. They want to sing along because they'll teach you what to sing at the concert. Right. And so like, there's a lot of people just do that. But then there's like people like us. We're like, I can't stop listening. I got to learn more. I got to figure it all out. There's so much to get into. And that was what it was for me was as soon as I heard like, you know, all these these live tracks that I'm starting to buy albums. I'm just like, there's so much history here. Cause at yeah. that point, you know, the band had started in 1973 is when their first album came out. So now this is 1997. So you think about all those years of history, you know, multiple decades that I can now dive into. And so yeah. that, that was the thing is you want, you want to learn about every album. You want to memorize every lyric you want to learn like why the album was made this way why was it different than this other one like you just your brain is <laughs> fully yeah. in that mode like at right. that time, i knew i was a fan because i couldn't stop talking about it and nobody else wanted to hear it 
<laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, there was so much lore that you can't, and they're really, I mean, I'm not, you know, and I'm sure we'll we'll get into it. Uh, but the, the lore is is definitely, uh, I mean, the lore lures you in, you know. <laughs> it really does. It really does. Um, so ultimately, when you start becoming a fan, it starts showing itself in certain ways, like we're both decked out, right? So. <laughs> Yeah, we got our shirts ready to go. So how did you start noticing, like, because you said your parents were okay with it, but what about people your age? When they start finding out, like, well, I'm a Kiss fan, you're talking about Kiss, what was the reaction? Yeah, I mean, that, that's the thing. You know, I have to also just a, a shout out to my dad because, like, he he got into Kiss, be, like, pretty much because I got him into it. And he, he'll tell, he's a Kiss fan. He'll tell you he's a Kiss fan, which is crazy because, you know, that's kind of, like, not really a common thing from when I was growing up, but um, so I, I think my friends used to think of it the same way, kind of as you were describing. And I think we we talked about it on one of your other shows where I was growing up and my friends looked at me like they finally heard the music and they thought they almost like thought they exposed the band. Like they are, like you said, Beth, like they are not expecting these almost you know, they're not expecting orchestral songs or love songs or anything like that. They're like, yeah, I put a kiss song on it. And it was like uh tiny Tim singing or something like that. Cause it, or Rod Stewart, you know, they didn't expect that, but then you turn on another song and you got God of thunder or, you know, these, these songs like Gene has. So they're, they run the gamut, but I think it wasn't, they're kind of like not always in line with what they look like. So some of my friends used to kind of bust my chops about that. But, you know, for the most part, they knew me as the kiss guy, like it just in general. And that's why I love talking about it and geeking out about it, because, um, you know, when you can relate to someone else who understands it, there's a, a lot of enthusiasm that goes along with it. Absolutely. Yeah. Like, cause like my friends, they just knew I, I didn't get a driver's license till after I graduated. So my friends were always giving me rides and I always had several kiss albums with me in my backpack everywhere I went. So I was like, okay, we're putting on a kiss album. And yeah, it's the time they were okay with that. And, but they were just like, they would listen to it. They're just like, what is this though? Like, yeah. Yeah. But I, I could tell you speaking about friends like that. Um, most, most of my friends will tell you that, the only reason why they know songs like not the real famous ones like, you know, rock and roll, but they'll know songs like, you know, War Machine because of me. You know, they'll they'll say, oh, I heard that first when Jay played it in his car or like you're saying. So I think, uh, you know, when you're a Kiss fan, you're always kind of, you know, you know, raising the flag and always touting the band and how great they are. Yeah, it, it, it is. It's interesting to see like the the either apathy or just like the repulsion or they're just like, okay, it's, it's okay, but it's not for me, you know, like wh wherever they're going to fall on that. Um, and I know that the thing is, like we said, like other people don't want to know all the facts that we're figuring out, but you start searching everywhere you can to find the information. So I'm curious, where were you going to learn the lore that you were talking about? So when I was, and that's such a cool part of it is that like growing up aside from like metal magazines, like going to the nearest, like if I was going to Rite Aid or something, picking up a metal, like a metal edge or whatever it was, hit parade or, you know, and sometimes you'd read articles in those, but for the most part, a lot of it was just word of mouth. Like my, my neighbors and different older people who I knew, like, sometimes my sister's friends or uncles or whatever, they would say things or I would have MTV on, you know, things like that really informed me about Kiss. But as years went on, uh, you know, there were different avenues to learn that stuff, which, you know, of course, you've, you've probably heard of the book history, you know, so they, they came up with this giant book you know, kiss Bible of, of all this stuff, which is like completely insane, a lot of money. But that was to me like incredible because that's exactly what you want. You're like, if you're like a person like who who's into stuff like we're into, you know, that is a dream come true to be able to have it all in a book and say, here's, let's just keep reading and reading about this 
you know, you know, mytho mythological band. So I think there was uh, it started out more low key, but then it became a much bigger thing. Yeah, yeah. It like you say, like you start there. This is what I want to say. So in the seventies, when Kiss started, they for people who don't know, they were never photographed or shown without their makeup. They got fooled one time, but other than that, like they never like any radio appearance that even if they didn't put on the makeup they would like wear helmets they would wear masks or whatever you couldn't see who they yeah, were right. and so in this era of the 70s okay they oh. were like heart throbs yes they, they were a mystery i j i just found at a thrift store a couple months back 20 copies of 16 magazine <laughs> all with kiss coverage this is from the late 70s to the early 80s and wow. it's contests it's meet kiss it's interviews with kiss it's like what do you know is gene simmons married and then like they get all like their funny things does like, gene simmons have a cow's tongue <laughs> yeah <laughs> exactly and so the cool thing about this is, so I'll just show you these real quick. Even like on the back covers, there's posters, you know, like, so every member of the band was featured as somebody, you know, to be admired, a pinup to put on your wall, right? Yeah, it's so incredible. Oh, that yeah. was the lore at the time. But by the time we're getting into them, you know, like 80s, 90s, they'd already taken off their makeup. And then like when I'm getting into them, they had just gotten back into makeup, but they existed. So speaking of makeup, there was a book that came out from a guy who used to work with them that I just like grabbed immediately. It was the only book that was behind the scenes at the time. Kiss and Sell. This was by right. the guy. He was their accountant. Yeah. <laughs> The guy who wrote this, but that means he was involved in like all their tour, everything they had to do, like when they needed money to do whatever they were going to do. So he tells all these stories. It's all like, you know, very business like. But I went on a church like summer camp thing and I covered this in brown paper so they wouldn't see what it was. And I would just like hide in my tent reading it or I'd be like be out under a tree. But they thought, you know, what it was it's not the Bible, but whatever it is. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm reading about Kiss at this church. Uh, oh man yeah so there was that but there was also this book here despite oh. the the cover this this book was awesome because what yeah. it did was it gave you the details on every album but also every related album every bootleg every album that a band member had been in another band like here's ah it's falling apart i've read it so much yes uh, but Mark St. John and White Tiger, who was one of yeah. the like, 80s guitarists. Like, I have that also. And it, and, the, and mine started falling apart, too. <laughs> it wasn't well bound. Uh, yeah. The last one I just want to say, I wanted to know if you went to this site, because this was like the site for me. But it was called Kiss Asylum. Kiss Asylum was like the number one website to go to. And it's, it's funny that you have that printed out, because, yeah. Uh, in the early days of the internet, when things were just so crude and like basic, we're, we're literally like, ev I mean, probably every day I'm logging, like what could possibly happen on a daily basis? Like now we live in a time where there's updates 12 times a day, but like, we're looking, whoa, there's an update once a day. Oh my God. Yeah. What could they possibly be talking and about? And there was like, always something. And I literally, I, the reason I printed this is this story right here. I contributed. You could send in pieces. Oh, to wow. the site. And I told them I was listening to the Mark and Brian morning radio program where uh, it, it, it basically they had a fan who said that he got his, uh, his autograph of Paul tattooed onto oh, his wow. arm. You know? Yeah. That's awesome. <laughs> well, she's like, I'm on Kiss Asylum. Yeah, that's so cool. It. My that's first so time cool. being published, you know. So, but yeah, and then like you said, Guitar World and and uh, Metal Edge and everything. I would just cut things out. This was on the front of my binder in high oh, school. Oh, sweet! Was, I like I'm that. I flipping around. So, so yeah, yeah, there was so many places to get your information, and it, you know, it only grew over time. Uh, I am curious, uh, real quick. Do you remember watching early video, like on? real player or little quick oh video. yes yes yeah you know, yeah especially like through sites like that and yeah it was just horrible to even think back that we had to go through that <laughs> yeah they'd be like maybe two minutes tops if you were lucky but like the big one for me was kiss had this album which we'll talk about in a bit but they they were like at like the lowest point of their career when they did this album they were on a saturday night live clone called fridays Fridays, and and, and yeah. so they performed on that and there was somebody had uploaded a clip and I was just like, I can't believe I'm seeing this. Like, Yes. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's like, you know, a lot of that stuff uh, for me, 
I had like on bootleg VHS tapes, you know, so like seeing it on the internet, I was like, I, I have that one. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, uh, and I got to show this one last thing. Just my room was all kiss at one point, but this was, I don't know if you remember these, these sold these at Spencer's gifts and it was like a roll. Yes. Of this stuff. And it was basically, you could just put it as a border around right. the top of your room. Yeah. But after, and I had this and I had one that had the solo album faces in it. And I just took those. And after I did my room, I just put them on everything else. Like all my binders, like anything I had, had a kiss. <laughs> That was a great thing because, yeah, Spencer's had like a, a relationship with Kiss in terms of selling merch. So there was always like it's something that you could find uh, yeah. Kiss related. Yeah. And we'll, we'll get deeper into the merch in a minute. But we got to start with what really hooked us, which was the music. Like you said, listening to Kiss, most people are just looking at Kiss and we somehow couldn't get enough of the music. So I during this time of the 90s, literally bought every Kiss album. They were all being released as remasters, they were called. And so you could go and get like a nice, you know, remixed version of these classic albums, which was perfect. So I want to go through each of these. We will give our favorite song from each album, and we'll, we'll go through the makeup era, the non-makeup era, back to the makeup era. So let me say here, Jay, Kiss... Their 1973 debut album. Yeah. What is your favorite track on here? So th it's easy for me because my favorite, not only my favorite track on that album, but my favorite track of all time from Kiss is Deuce, which is, you know, I think, you know, a lot of people might say that because they used to open a lot of their shows with Deuce. Uh, and it's also, th to me, there's, there's a point where obviously, you know, but for people who aren't fans of Kiss, there's a point in the, in the song where they're sort of swaying back and forth with their guitars, you know, to the left and to the right. And they've got this choreographed thing going on. Yeah. And uh, I saw that. And I'm like, this is unreal, you know, because I think what some people like, maybe your friends might say, okay, maybe that's cheesy or corny. You, you, there's, there's always like a juxtaposition with this band where they are super hard and loud and bombastic, but they're also like, they're doing a choreographed dance on stage. So it's just so much fun in every way possible, you know? Yeah, it's like, it's like a tradition. Yeah, that, yeah. They, that they carried through their entire career. Now for me, like that is like a quintessential Kiss song, but I always land on Strutter. Yeah. Strutter is a great song because Kiss, ultimately, you know, there's this term cock rock, right? Like, they are about, like, getting girls and talking about how great they are and that they're the ultimate lover and all this kind of stuff. But right. Strutter is about a girl who's, like, the ultimate woman that, like, is unattainable. And yeah. the thing I like about it, though, is every version, whether Kiss recorded it, like, they re-recorded it for their double platinum album and they did a great new version of it there, but then they also like have had other people cover it. Like they did a, a cover album that they produced and the band Extreme did an awesome like funky cover of Strutter. Yes. The Detroit Rock City soundtrack, the girl punk band, the Donnas. The Donnas, the yeah. Of Strutter, like everybody that covers it, it sounds great. It's just solid rock and roll, so. You're right, you're absolutely right. And I agree with you. And I just dropped something. <laughs> All right, so our next one here, this is their, their second album. This is Hotter Than Hell. Uh, has a lot of interesting imagery on here. There's a lot of lore that goes with these pictures. Oh, there uh, is, yeah. Yeah, there's like all sorts <laughs> of stuff that the band was up to that caused problems with these <laughs> photos. Yes. Uh, but it's also very arguably like their worst album in terms of production. It sounds really strange. It does sound, it sounds like low quality, but I also, I kind of like that with the first like three albums that like the audio quality is like kind of mediocre. They've since remastered them and everything. But uh, with, with that album, uh, my favorite track on there is, is definitely um, uh, you're going to be surprised. I think watching you, which is not what I think people think, you know, I think uh, I used to my, former self would have said parasite uh or you know hotter than hell but as i've gotten older i realized watching you just that's that's my favorite track from the album it's just really good how, how about you 
Um, I think so. The one that always gets caught in my head that's an earworm is All the Way. It's this really weird Gene song that's so basic. It's just like, bam, bam, bam. Like yeah, I love All the Way. To it hardly. Yeah. But the one that I always think is great because when they play it live, it's even better is Let Me Go Rock and Roll. Like, it's just straight oh, yeah. ahead, like, rock and roll just jamming. And that's what they do. Like, they jam when they play it together live. And it's just, like, all all out. That's what Kiss is supposed to be. Like, rock and roll, like, defined, right? So I think they, they project it through that song really well. Absolutely. Yeah, I agree. All right. So next one here is one of the first ones I know that you saw back in the day. And that is Dress to Kill. Here they are in the suits of their manager, Bill Acoyne, had to lend them these suits to wear. Oh, yeah. And, and so I, this is kind of, like I said, it's one of the first things that made me fall in love with Kiss because, so they're on a street corner in lower Manhattan and, you know, they're getting that photo taken and you see, you see these guys in this monstrous makeup and they're in these tiny, well, Gene is in a tiny suit for sure. And, you know, like, this looks so weird, but cool. And uh, as I got older, I said, I always wanted to just, that's going to be my cosplay, you know, Gene in a suit. <laughs> so I did that a bunch of times that I was literally like going to a kiss party one night in lower Manhattan. Uh, and it's like, there was a few people dressed in costume and I'm, I have to walk from where I parked. <laughs> to this bar <laughs> like people are stopping like oh my god it's gene simmons like and i got the the huge boots on and the tiny like <laughs> the pants are like <laughs> so short but it was it was wild and uh that album specifically was uh i think is is really so underrated i think for me ladies in waiting is is my favorite track off that album that that is a very Gene Simmons song because he, he is he he actually wrote a book if I remember right about prostitution right like he just thought like, <laughs> it's the oldest profession I'm gonna tell you all about it and why it's great it's like, <laughs> crazy um, for me on there, uh, there there's a there's a lot of great tunes um, the one that always gets me though and I think it gets a boost because I was introduced through you wanted the best you got the best but that is room service. Which is about being a rock star on the road and how ladies are always throwing themselves at you, right? Like, <laughs> but that is, again, quintessential rock and roll fantasy. And it's so, it's a funny song. Like, there's, there's a song about, like, this, like, young girl, like, coming on to him and then the dad's getting mad at him, you know? Like, <laughs> it's, just, it's so funny. Like, so I, I, I love that song, but they recorded it for, like, I say that because... You, know, you wanted the best you got the best it's supposed to be their live tracks but all their live albums technically were only partially live and a lot of it was just recorded in studio or in a an empty theater to get it perfect and that's one of those songs which you listen to it and you're like yeah maybe the guitars or maybe the drums are from the 70s but those vocals are all 1997 1996 paul you know like, yeah yeah very no, I know their, their vocal stylings change so much from the early days to where they oh, absolutely yeah totally uh speaking of live albums just real quick you know this is the one that made them famous i mean alive you know collected what kiss was which was a live act and really brought that to everybody here uh that you know needed to listen you needed to hear it um do you have a favorite live version of a song from this album uh, you know, that's a, it's a good question. I'm, and to be honest, like, so that you're right. A lot of people got into kiss from listening to the live uh, album because you're thinking, well, this is more of a, of how we can capture the band in their element rather than the studio tracks. Uh, and I agree with that. I'm just like, in general, not a, like, I love the album but I'm not a huge fan of live albums in general. Oh. So for, yeah. So for me, um, I mean, I, I'll listen to that album, you know, just over and over again. Uh, but I think, believe it or not, um, I think rock and roll all night is better on that album than it is, you know, and you hear it. I think it's fun on the studio track, but that's kind of what really put them into the next level. So I think, just if, if you don't say rock if you don't say rock and roll all night 
you're kind of doing them a disservice only you know it's like that's really what made them famous that that on because it was it was on dress to kill which you showed before and it wasn't a huge hit so yeah so the live version is what got everybody excited about going to see them and feeling like oh this band has something like i'll just say for me on there there's a song called come on and love me which is also from dress to kill which is just a great tune but it sounds so much better when paul is just like hyped up and the adrenaline is so it's fun Funny that you mentioned that because uh, with "Come On and Love Me" on there, I rem- that was the first time I realized like, uh, and you're saying how the the, the vocals always kind of change a little bit. So on that on that track, uh, Gene would say "Come On and Love Me," and he was like very gruff with it. But when you listen to the studio track, it's a little bit different. It's a little bit more melodic and not not as like, but then you hear Gene just with that, like, you know. And yeah, because on the studio track, he does falsetto and yeah. live, he goes low and gravelly. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Awesome. So it's just interesting because you know those little nuances and, you know, all the fans do. It's just nuts. We've listened to it so many times. Yeah, you start picking up those things. Um, But here's the big one here. This was a very like divisive album at the time but ultimately had like their biggest hit for the moment which this is destroyer from 1976 bob ezrin is the producer on this and he really shaped the album he really turned it into something special he he's the one who added all this orchestral stuff so beth is on here detroit rock city which they later you know named their movie after and all that kind of stuff so yeah uh, destroyer there's a lot of interesting tracks on here what's your favorite um that's a good question i think um i you know i want to say it's a toss-up for me because i love my favorite track is really god of thunder but detroit rock i hate going with the common answer but detroit rock city is so good it's so hard to to not say that that song is is like my favorite on the album you know um because i like it's an amazing album no matter what but i think if i was if I was gonna, I could easily go up and do karaoke to God of Thunder. Then I'm like, man, Detroit Rock City is gonna get everybody up on their feet. So I think it's a toss up for me. But uh, I mean, I, I guess if I had to really decide, I think I would go probably Detroit Rock City. No, it's it's a great tune, and again, it shows what they were capable of, and it really changed their abilities. Like Bob Ezrin said, you guys just can't play like these chords all the time and just keep it simple. Like you got to have levels, you got to change your uh, your tempo, you got to do all sorts of stuff and make it interesting, and that's what they did there. Um, so that's the first song on the album. The last song on the album is "Do You Love Me," and that's that's the song that always got me. Again. If Paul Stanley is singing about being a rock and roll star, okay, I'm going to listen. And that's what it's about. It's, I'm so great. I got all this money. I got private jets. Everybody loves to hear me play my guitar. But do you actually love me, girlfriend, hanger on, whoever you are, right? Like, so there's, there's, that's what Paul always brought to the band was a little bit of like, it was kind of a mature theme, kind of a vulnerability that you could see in that at the same time saying, I'm an awesome rock star, but do you right. Right. It wasn't always like the the gene bravado where there was no doubt in his mind. He didn't care really if they loved him or not. Like he he knows they're in the palm of his hand. But yeah, Paul had the he had the heart, right? Yeah. Yeah, Um, So next one here, because Destroyer was so experimental, they decided they had to go straight back to, you know, just meat and potatoes, rock and roll. And they recorded this album, Rock and Roll Over, which has one of the great album covers. I mean, you just look at that. It's amazing. It's so it's such a classic album cover. Um, I used I used to have uh, I used to have just like a regular like a, I don't know if it was a Jan Sport, like a black backpack in high school. And for like all four years, I had that patch on the back of my backpack. Like it was like, it's just the thing. It was the thing that I had to have. You know, it wasn't uh, by accident, you know, it was yeah, my me too. I, I had an army jacket. I still have it that I put all these kiss patches on. And that was one of them. I have all yeah. the solo album uh, patches on one arm and then I have, you know, I have rock and roll over to kiss army patch on the other oh so. yeah and it's such an underrated album you know um it's crazy because you know some of the songs are they're not as like 
necessarily like hard rocking you know or like super bombastic but i mean they're they're fun rock tracks uh and that, it's a tough one because there's so many there's so many amazing songs on it i think i think for me i i'm gonna go take me take me is amazing the lyrics are incredible the uh, opening yeah. line put your <laughs> hand in my pocket, in my pocket grab onto my, to my rocket amazing Who else is saying that in that amazing yeah, yeah. <laughs> i love the innuendos yeah well and speaking of innuendo that i think was unintentional mr speed is the song that I love. It's such a, like a weird kind of almost like country groove to it that Paul plays this song. And it's really cool. Uh, I mean, Dr. Love is great, but I think the live version of Dr. Love is the best version. But Mr. Speed, the ladies call me Mr. Speed. It makes you think something else. Not that he's so fast to like yeah. parts, I think is his yeah. point. But that's not <laughs> what you get out of the <laughs> lyrics ultimately. <laughs> <laughs> oh okay um next one here though 1977 love gun okay so this is the first time all four members of the band sang on the album previously it was just peter would sing and mostly gene and paul but ace had never sung a song even though he was writing songs so he gets his debut track here uh but what is your favorite here so the opening track is I Stole Your Love. And that is, for me, it's always been one of my favorites. Just, um, and it's what I found, what I loved about it is that you mentioned earlier Detroit Rock City, the movie that they had. So when that came out, of course, I was like front and side. I think I, I skipped school that day to go, <laughs> to go uh, watch the movie. But the opening of the movie has, I, like when the credits kick in, they they put on the album and they're playing i stole your love I'm like that really captures a lot for me because that song it's just it's fast it just it makes it makes you just want to like bounce around your room uh so that that's definitely and of course it, it's hard to pick i mean the, all these songs are just incredible so uh but that would be my pick it, and it's great like when you watch the old footage of they would start their concert off with that and they're on these risers or they had a staircase like that they would come down and like and paul is just like <laughs> like flying all over the place there's so much energy coming out so that is a great song i always though just have to go with the the title track with love gun is this one's a little beat up but i i picked up this vinyl copy recently and I I love that song so much. Like, there's so much power to it. They still play it to this day. And, you know, Paul makes that his song when he flies out into the crowd on a line, like, onto a little stage. Like, and so, but um, to me, it's the outro solo. Like, when, when uh, Ace is just going, like, that just gets me every time. Like, I just yeah. love it so much. So, oh, so good. Uh, so we talked a little bit about the live tracks again, some of the better versions. So Alive 2, just real quick. So this was, again, they had made all these these three albums. Then they recorded a live concert that had all the songs from that album. Then they released all the ones we just talked about. So they had all these new songs they were playing live and they put it on this double album here. This is the uh, the picture that Jay was talking about. Look at Gene Simmons. There. Oh, yeah. Sweaty, yeah. And tripping. it's like... He, he... He's got all, if anyone wants to like Google that, like he's got all blood. He, he, he just, he looks like a movie monster. He really does. Yeah. And so, but the thing is they also, as a bonus released the final side of the second record had four new tracks on it. And so you can actually get new kiss music and some of their live stuff. Um, do you have a favorite of those original tracks? Uh, I, I, I think I'm going to go all american man uh even though i have to be honest like you know i i always say this i think i probably said it to you on uh, one of your other uh podcasts is that to me there's no bad kiss like it's like pizza pizza there's everyone says you can't have bad pizzas you know as long as it's pizza it's still good so this, for me someone could say oh that's the worst kiss song like, even the worst kiss song is still good to me because it's kiss so I think in, in those cases, those songs aren't great. One of them's like a cover of the Dave Clark Five or something. I just think uh, All American Man is one of the better ones. Although it kind of was just like, let's put a few extra songs on this to sweeten the deal for the people. But 
uh yeah i think that would probably be my my best one yeah i mean i i love that song a lot you know i'm a six foot hot look all american man you know like that's just that's a great lyric but for me when i first listened to the album the one that just blew my mind just sonically just listening to it was rocket ride because ace freely had only done shock me on the love gun album this was his next you know original song that he was presenting and rocket ride it just starts out with this riff which has this really heavy flange effect on it if anybody out there plays guitar you know the flange effect and it's it just like what am i hearing it's it's doing opposite sounds to what he's playing and it's it's in the background and, and it has like a super like long solo and it's just like it's it's a wild wild song and it's just like baby wants it fast baby wants some flash she wants a rocket ride you can read yeah it all you well want. so <laughs> they they hit so many like of like they hit so many of the notches because not only like you said it sounds space age which and that was ace's entire he did a great job of creating songs that fit into his character which again is like one of the one of the great things about kiss is that you know they have all characters and a lot of their music and their songs fit into their characters rocket ride there you go space rockets right and then the sound itself that they created in the song does sound a little space age, which a lot of his other songs did too. Uh, but with that specifically, not only did you get that, but you also got the sexual innuendo <laughs> and they, you know, there's everything fits in and it's just, it's fantastic, but it also rocks. So there you go. Yeah. It was, it was the most like straight ahead, like just get you psyched type of song. Um, we should mention also Kiss, like they were selling a lot of albums. They weren't a niche band, okay? They were voted like the biggest band in the country. Beth from the Destroyer album won a Grammy. We didn't mention that when that came out. Like they were a big deal. Their albums were going double platinum. So they released an album called Double Platinum. Okay, this yeah, the CD reproduction of it. But the uh, original one was also <clears throat> embossed and shiny like this. Um, I, I love double platinum yeah so to tell tell them what the premise is behind double platinum what do they do with these songs that were already their hits of their back catalog so well they re-recorded them uh with and I, I don't know all the specific details but i know that they were re-recorded for the album uh and there was uh I, they they have like the remix of strutter on there right yeah, so, so it's like, it's like it, they remastered and like changed levels and added yeah. like different like guitar sounds or drum sounds. Like they just, it was just like Kiss, like you've never heard him before. You know, it <laughs> but, was almost like yeah, but I don't know. For me, I guess <laughs> like when I was younger, I was totally into how it looked because it would look like a really cool shiny uh, album, you know. Uh, but I don't know if I really was aware of all the details and you know really fine details that they did to change a lot of these songs and then when you're reading books like you brought up before then you get to really see like oh wow this this was a different version and you come to appreciate some of the other versions because there's things that might be completely different and you don't even realize it so yeah i mean definitely now the thing I realized is if somebody's watching this and they're like, oh, I know Jay, I know Adam, I've heard of Kiss, we didn't tell them all the names of the band members and what their personas were. Okay, so real quick, we're getting into their solo albums. Yes, Kiss released four solo albums, one by each member of the band simultaneously. Okay, and they got to just write their own songs, do their own things separate from the band which led to a variation uh that was very strange uh, but before we get into that the other thing that was happening at this time in 1978 was they made a movie and that movie was called kiss meets the phantom of the park and it was on nbc just before halloween and it was it was a movie that was produced by hannah barbera where kiss were superheroes <laughs> and yep. It is it is wild. It is silly. Um, I I still have my. They they did release a commercial copy, but I have my bootleg tape. I got off eBay back in the day when you could still buy bootlegs on eBay. Yep. Um, but I also once in an antique store in the nineties found the original script. Oh my gosh! Somebody I don't know how they had a copy of it here, but it was just like it was. It's just all the dialogue. So when I watched the movie, I could read along. You know. <laughs> 
<laughs> I just want to read real quick the descriptions of the characters here. Yeah. Uh, just again to give you an idea of the band. So Peter Chris is known as the cat man and his fellow group member and like his fellow group members wears makeup which evokes and reflects his fantasy persona his feline agility takes on superhuman dimensions when the power of his talisman is evoked <laughs> yes Paul Stanley is aptly called Star Child as his makeup features a black starred eye which can immobilize with a ray like effect he also possesses total recall and has the ability to read minds when his talisman is at work Ace Freely, the spaceman, is monosyllabic and super friendly. Communicating largely through gestures and sounds, Ace might be best described as an other galactic Harpo Marx. <laughs> <laughs> Which is, if you know Ace Freely, he's like the biggest talker of the Yeah, but, yeah exactly. But, Apparently, the, the lore I've heard is when the screenwriters went to meet with the band, Ace was just like being really silly and he yeah. wouldn't say anything. And he'd just go, ack, ack, yeah. Really? Ah. You know, and he just wouldn't do anything to give them an in. So they're like, I guess that's his persona. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but finally, Gene Simmons is known as the demon, but a friendly one. He cannot speak unless he is wired electronically. And even then, his speech is sparse and cryptic and more often than not punctuated by electronic growls and menacing gestures and movements. When Gene's personal talisman is at work, he's able to spit bursts of flame at will and possesses superhuman strength. Yes. I never knew that was the explanation for why his <laughs> had an effect on it. I just feel like a lot of it tied into, you know, they were in the comic books and the Marvel comics at the time and everything. Uh and try they could have just made since it was Hanna Barbera, they could have just made it uh an animated. I think that might have been like an it animated been better, movie. Yeah. Been cool, yeah. <laughs> Easier to swallow. Um <laughs> But let's get into the solo albums here. So let's start with Gene Simmons. I mean, these beautifully painted covers. They came with posters inside. I mean, these were awesome. Now, Gene got a million guest stars. That's what he did. He got all these popular you know, rock and roll artists and pop musicians of the day to be on his album with him. So like Cher is on it because he was dating Cher, you know, like just random stuff like that. But what is your favorite song on this track? Because he goes so far as to sing When You Wish Upon a Star. From yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> And also you were mentioning um, people who were on that album. If I'm not mistaken, Peggy Bundy, was on a singer on there and yeah, uh, before Seagal. she was yeah. yeah but yeah katie yeah before she was super famous um yeah so uh wait so you're you're asking me are you asking me my favorite track off favorite there track what, oh, on Gene's oh, yeah. solo album so i you know obviously i think one of the one of the main ones is radioactive that was like you know the big song and i i would think when i was younger i probably would have picked that but there is a song on there, um, Always Near You, Nowhere to Hide. It is completely, like, not something I would have ever thought uh, I would be into. But in my adult life, I think that's one of my favorite tracks off the album. Because he actually, one of the things he doesn't get commended for, I'm not saying this is, like, a great overall album, Soup to Nuts, but... There's a lot of experimentation on it um, that he he really does a lot of different things on here. He's doing like some soul. He's got all got some gospel. He's got everything on this album. And I think the only thing it's lacking is the real like hard demonic Gene Simmons song. Like you don't have a radioactive is as close as you're going to get to it, but it's, that's still kind of a fun rock mu music track. It's not like, it's not like a God of thunder or, you know, like, a, no, like you can tell, like his biggest influence is the Beatles. And so right. there's just a lot of stuff. Like I'm trying to sound like the Beatles. He got this, you know, Beatle tribute band called Beatlemania to sing backup on his right. songs, like the Beatles. 
like so yeah it's definitely like more melodic and poppy type stuff um i will say for me i love man of a thousand faces yes which is he wrote about lon chaney Lon Chain, Senior, like yes. the old phantom of the opera that classic you know stuff like it, it, it's, it's just really orchestral but like it, it builds and builds to this big crescendo and it's just it's a triumphant song so i, I love what he's doing there on that yeah yeah uh, now how about paul's solo album here so this is my favorite believe it or not of the solo album i mean i think the the popular choice is you know is ace and yeah i I think okay if you're gonna look at all of them as you know in a subjective way i mean i think i mean ace has a lot of we'll get to it but paul's is my favorite in terms of i could listen to the whole thing it it really fits it's it's what you expect from a paul stanley solo album it's very kiss it's i think it's the most kiss in fact uh i mean like the ace one is too but i just think paul's could be any of the other kiss albums so uh but the songs on there like i love i love all the songs but i think i'm gonna go with um it's all right i think that's one of my favorite tracks off there yeah that's great and my favorite thing was paul Staley went on a solo tour but i think it was like 10 years ago now or something yeah. and yep. it was great uh he released a solo album and then he did that and i, I he played so many tracks from his solo album on there yeah. it was awesome oh yeah it was so good uh, but mine is together as one which is like this it starts super like quiet and it's like you know and it, it, then it just it literally like the entire song is it building 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 until it's just like hard rock like at the end and you're just like oh i love this like the, you just get that release at the end that you're just the tension is building like it's so good so it's a love song but then it's like a heartbreak song and he's just like you know it's got a whole atmosphere to it so i love the production on that it's great um it's now awesome. this is everybody's least favorite solo album because it's the most not kiss i would say which is peter chris's solo album yeah <laughs> i have to like i i have to be honest like i don't even i really don't even have a favorite <laughs> off of there because no it's like i owned it i just i'd never even really put it on too often uh there i mean there are some some tracks on there where you're like yeah this it doesn't really fit. I mean, some of them are a little bit, I think, self-indulgent uh, and not fitting in too much with Kiss. So, um, but I, I don't really have a favorite off that album. Interesting. How about, how about you? Yeah. And I'll just say like my, so in my Kiss fandom, every holiday, every time I got money, I'm spending it on Kiss albums or merch. Every holiday was buy me a Kiss album, buy me this. So my aunt in New Jersey, so uh, she's lived in Newark. She's like, what do you want for Christmas? I'm like, I need a Kiss album. I need Peter Chris's solo album because I don't want to buy it myself. And she sent it to me, but she sent it to me on cassette. And I was just like, oh, but I'm buying them all on CD. And I had to return it, you know. But, but so the thing is, Peter is so different. And that's what he brings to the band is like the more R&B, like jazz swing. And it's infused just very lightly into Kiss's music. Right. But there's a great song on there that if you just want, like, what's 100% Peter Chris rock and roll? And it's this song called That's the Kind of Sugar Papa Likes. Yeah, <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, but, it's, <laughs> but it's so like... It just, it has his scratchy screams. It has like the groove to it. Like it's just, if you're gonna go all Peter Chris, cause again, a lot of it is like, there's like acoustic stuff where he's la 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 la. You're like, don't sing yeah. like that Peter. Yeah, you know, yeah. But like this one's like full bore. Um, so that, yeah, yeah, that's what I always go to. But the final one here again, the popular choice for the solo albums, and it is just straight rock and roll, but also some interesting experimentation. There's an instrumental track at the very end. Yeah. And, and Ace is the one who probably had the most successful solo career after the band. So what do you fall on? Like New York Groove is what everybody yeah. knows. And you hear that right. at sporting events and everything. But. Yeah, and you, yeah, you mentioned, I'm glad you mentioned it because um, in fact, a lot of people I talk to still to this day don't realize that and being, you know, I'm from, obviously from Jersey, but in New York and everything, it's like the team's. They all play it all the times on the commercials of, for the sports teams and the Yankees and everything. Um, but it's crazy. A lot of people don't realize it's, it's, it's ace or it's kiss. And um, I think that may be like one of the most notorious kiss songs that people don't even realize it's kiss, you know? <laughs> so, um, 
but I think my favorite off that would be Snowblind. Yeah, yeah that's, that, that's an favorite. interesting one about just being on tour and being like so high and disillusioned and just trying to, yeah, that that's a, a wild song. I really like Speeding Back to My Baby. Uh, cause, cause that's just another one. Like he wrote it with his wife. Like she helped him. It's about like having a fight with your girlfriend and then like driving off mad in your car, but then deciding to come back, you know, and you get, you know, so it's, it's, just, it's got a whole story to it, which I really like. Um, now the next one here, this is again, like in the movie, Detroit rock city, they make a joke. Kiss will never record a disco album. Disco sucks. That was that yeah. tagline. Of right. The movie. And they yep. came out with this album, Dynasty, in 1979. What do we think? I, I see. I am one of the people who, like, I I actually enjoy disco. <laughs> and I used when I worked in radio, the whole concept of the station that I worked at for many many years because it was a thing. Like back back then, people who liked hard rock and like metal and stuff, you know, disco was just the antithesis. So they hated it. I love it because to me, there's a huge relationship between hard music, like hard rock and metal and disco. It's got driving beats. It's like, and that's one thing, one thing I could say about Kiss, like if you really listen, almost every song they have, you could probably sort of dance to it in a way. Like they're, they've got this driving beat to everything they do, you know? And, and I'm not going to say you're going to dance like, you know, at a club, but you can move around to their music, you know, not just like nod your head up and down. Yeah. Uh, but I, I enjoyed disco and I thought that obviously they had a huge hit with uh, I Was Made For Loving You. And, and it's still to this day a huge hit. Uh, they, it was just in the Fall Guy, the, re, yep. the movie, you know. I um, saw that movie only because I found out that song was in it. I'm like, oh really? I, I would, I liked the, the TV show when I was growing up, so oh. I got, I got to see this, you know. Um, but no, I think if I, I always try to avoid going with the obvious, you know, and that's an amazing song, and it probably is. But I think I'd go just to be different. I'll go with uh, Magic Touch. Oh, that was my vote too. Yeah, it's that so song good. is so great. Paul has like awesome falsetto in that. Like, it, yeah, it, it's really and it's it's like the most like actual like rocking song. It's rocks. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, but yeah, so and I did pick up a vinyl copy recently as well, and I had this poster on my the back of my bedroom door for years. Yeah, and years. That's my, I, you know what I had? I had it wasn't a poster, but I had, and I believe it was from Spencer's. Uh, it kind of like a like a cloth type of poster. Oh, like, yeah. It was a big banner of that. And I had that in my room too. So we, we have that in common. <laughs> I'm glad we finally hit on the same one for that. Yeah. Album. Yeah. Great. Uh, but so they had like, it was like the, the album was like half disco, half rock dynasty. Then they went full pop music in 1980 with unmasked okay so unmasked has the most bizarre album cover it is a like cartoon like comic strip about they can't show their faces they can't show their faces and at the end they take off their faces and they just have kiss makeup on <laughs> anyway yeah it, i love it i love the, and to be honest i i never understood why but i mean if you're a real kiss fan you obviously appreciate this album but it would it, everything you read, especially back in the day, would always be like, you know, it didn't sell a lot of albums, right? And it was popular in Australia. Okay, great. I think it's a phenomenal album. I just think, I mean, there to be honest, I don't think there's like really a bad track on it, and it's even hard to to choose uh, an amazing uh, one of these amazing songs. But I think I'll go with, I'm gonna go with Shandy just because I. I just love Shandy. I think it's a great song. Yeah. And uh, for me, it's what makes the world go round because yeah. it's a Paul Stanley understood the assignment. We're not yeah. doing rock and roll. We're doing pop music and it's all melodies and it's all like, you know, just it, it's it's such a great song. If you guys look at that one up, you're like, this is Kiss. Yeah, this is Kiss. But he, yeah. he gets into some more falsetto and some other stuff in there. And so it's just, it's a very fun. And the thing to know about this is by the time Kiss got to Dynasty, it was like Kiss overexposure in the world. And like they were now appealing to kids. They had totally lost their edge. And so 
by 1980, they couldn't even like have a tour for this album. Nobody cared about Kiss. So they had to go to Australia where they had never been. And they were like the biggest thing in the entire continent. You know, like everybody yeah. came to see them and they were like huge. But in the United States, nobody cared anymore. And I think, you know, we're at a weird time because like, you know, you said we 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 passed that disco album. Uh, and now like it's that kind of... <laughs> It's like that David Cassidy kind of era, right? So that's kind of, they're trying to, what are they, they're trying, what, how do we appeal to people who are going to buy these albums? You know, they're trying to stay relevant. Uh, and that, I will commend them because when we're looking at all these albums, I love going through the album because you get to see the changes. You know, they, they start out as that grungy New York City, local, like independent, rock and roll hard like hard rock almost a metal band mm -hmm. you know during like a black sabbath era and like look at what they start morphing into over all these albums it's just absolutely incredible so i personally think if anyone wants to you know criticize their music i say look at what these guys have done in their career it's just astronomical to be able to go through all these genres and still be continue to be a band and make money and it's it's unbelievable yeah. Now, the thing is, that didn't work. Pop music didn't work. So they're like, well, who's like a respected band? And it's like Pink Floyd. What does Pink Floyd do? Concept albums. <laughs> and so like, we're, they're like, we're doing terrible. Let's go back to the guy who gave us a great album in Destroyer, got us our Grammy, Bob Ezrin come help us yeah we need you bob and he convinces them to do a concept album called music from the elder okay <laughs> music from the elder is a medieval fantasy album about a boy who is the chosen one and he's fighting the forces of evil maybe we don't know because there's actually not a story there there's a there's songs that kind of tell a story but there were there were like pieces they recorded that were actual dialogue you only hear a tiny bit at the very end they cut it all out but there yeah. was a story to be told this is bizarre <laughs> and yeah and from what you know just from what i've heard in interviews and everything like the idea was that they wanted to do a sort of like maybe like a broadway production or some sort of stage show which i you know i have to say like obviously this was they'll they'll sort of like you know crap on it because it wasn't commercially successful but when you look at the bands of the time when you had like rush and like you said pink floyd and bands that were doing these kind of like uh different uh con like concept albums and they they did something different and i would have i would have thought it would be pretty interesting to see something like that would it have worked maybe not but um i think i just love that it also adds to the lore like we're yeah. saying like and if some when you really look at the album cover when we're talking about the lore of kiss uh you know if we like let's say you grew up and you're a fan of dungeons and dragons or something like this is the kind of stuff that fits right into your wheelhouse you know especially like the, the stuff of what they're singing about and this kid who's trying to find an island or i don't know who the hell knows what's happening but it's still I think it's interesting uh, ultimately, and, and yeah. some some of the songs are really super underrated too. So yeah, it'll, uh, it'll 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 catch your attention with the theme. The look at the time they cut their hair shorter, and yes. like they were wearing like chain mail. Yeah, I don't know what Paul's doing. He's got like a headband, the Rambo and, like, headband. <laughs> <laughs> like, what is going on? So, but what is what is the song then that you attach yourself to from this album? Uh, I mean, I, I think. I'm going to go with uh, the oath. The oath is, I think, you know, World Without Heroes is very famous, you know, for for KISS fans, but I'm going to go with the oath. I think that's that's the one that I like. Yeah, they, they recorded music videos for some of these songs, and one of them is a World Without Heroes, and at the end, Gene Simmons cries a single tear. <laughs> like, it's just like, oh, no, you guys misunderstood who you are. But yeah, the oath is the best song on the album. And in fact, when they remastered it, like, or when it was released, the oath, they put it out at the top of the album. Like, it's still rock and roll. It's still rock and roll. It was the first song that played, but that wasn't what they intended in the in the story. So then you get into like all this, like, like there's 
loot there's loot there's like what it, i don't understand what's happening now there's orchestra and all the stuff so yeah so it gets crazy but the oath is the best song that's the one i was saying when i found the video clip the to watch and like oh they're on fridays and they're playing the oath i was like i can't believe they actually played a song from this album live because i know nobody <laughs> went to see a tour of this there was not a, a tour they could do uh, yeah. but they did try to course correct okay they did say none of this is working the last <laughs> yeah. three years we were lost we got to get back to heavy rock and roll that's what it's got to be about that's what everybody thinks we are we got to deliver that and they did it with creatures of the night unfortunately nobody was listening jay you actually look like you're on this album cover right now <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know, I'm glad you said that because it is my absolute favorite number one Kiss album of all time. And I think um, the reason for that is is mainly because when I became a Kiss fan, that's the album that was on the shelves, you know. So um, it was also the album cover itself was, you know, just absolutely eye catching and um, the music video for um i love it loud and i'm not going to say that that's my my favorite i won't commit to that just yet but uh the music video for me really just man if 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 someone is listening and hasn't seen the music video for i love it loud look it up on youtube because that captures the 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 live kiss show because they're up on stage yeah but then there's also like the wrap around, you know, where the kid becomes like a zombie watching the TV and his eyes light up and everything. I don't know. It's just it's so cool. And Gene looks badass and everything. Um, so I think it was like really, you know, like you said, it's like a return to form because they said, all right, we did disco. We did concept. We did, uh, you know, singer songwriter, David Cassidy stuff. We do. You know, we're doing everything. Um, and now we got to go back to the basics. And they had Vinnie Vincent. So it really gave this element where it was this, it was hard music. And I think, I think it's one of their, to me, it's their best album, but I think we should speaking of new members of the band. So at this time, after unmasked, Peter Chris left the band. He's like, I want to go solo. I'm better than all of you. And I'm leaving the band. So he, he quit. And then Ace Freely quits right when this album is coming out. He's saying, I'm done. What was this elder thing we did? I'm tired of touring. I don't want to do anything. Just let me out of the band. And so they both left. We, they got a new drummer, Eric Carr, who was amazing. His makeup was the Fox. So the first time the fans saw him on an album was Creatures of the Night. And his drum sound is out of control. Amazing. Like the production on this, uh, what, what he does there. And then they needed a new guitar player. And they, they auditioned a ton of people to come in and be their new lead guitar player because Ace had left. And they end up with this guy they, they were kind of writing songs with. And he kind of weaseled his way in to becoming the newest lead guitarist in the band because he was an amazing guitarist, but an absolute lunatic and crazy egotist. And he would just play like 10 minute solos during their concerts and they would have to like <laughs> cut his amp, you know, like, you're done, you're done. No more of this, you know? Yeah. And he, he was the Egyptian warrior. That was his look at uh, an Egyptian on his yeah. face. Yeah. Yeah. So that's what Which, we're in here right now. They're trying to keep the makeup alive. They're trying to give us hard rock. So what song do you think uh, reached you the best? So um, I, I, I love I wanted to, I really want to say, um, I want to say I love it loud, but I'm going to go with War Machine because it, and it, it, it's a prime example of what I was trying to say before, where their music has this kind of groove. It's got this, you could like, if you listen, when, when Gene starts to get to kick in War Machine, He's he he's he's moving his hips around, and you're just getting into it. the whole crowd is just like mesmerized by this band, and it's almost like when they're making these songs, like he knows how to get the who how to capture the audience, you know, because this song does such a great job of that. And um, I mean, again, I I I think this is my favorite album because 
it, every track is listenable and and I could listen to it as an album. Whereas sometimes you listen to an album and you'll skip a track or two. You know, this for me is just one of the best. Like, yeah, the, the all the production thing. just works. All the songs sound of a piece. The one that I always go back to is Danger. Yeah. Uh, Paul Stanley plays the song Danger, which is just like like it just gets you into it. He's like kind of wailing the whole time. Like it is fantastic. And even Paul Stanley on this album has added a lot more grit to his voice. So there's a little scratch on everything he's doing. And the danger is what they're trying to project on the album. And that always like hit me now. Oh yeah. And it has like a really big drum sound from Eric, like you were saying. Yeah. Uh, and just before you go on, though, I think it we the lore again because you you know they brought uh, two new characters into the band, like you said, Eric and and Vincent, and they've got the uh, new the actual new personas, which adds to the lore. A lot of a lot of fans started to say, "Oh, this is a joke," because you know, but you I never looked at them as just a band. They weren't just four guys playing instruments this was they were superheroes and a band you know so it's like to me yeah that this is just adding to the storyline i love this you know <laughs> for sure and unfortunately like th this was like again they're trying to get their footing there was an album that was released it was only released internationally but while they were trying to find their groove for creatures of the night they, they said, well, you need a best of album and give us a few new tracks to promote with it. And it was called Killers. And this is their look from the Elder because right. they hadn't defined their Creatures of the Night look. Also, you'll notice here, uh, you know, the, the logo. Yeah. yeah. So in, in Europe, because of, you know, the SS and all the history right. of World War II, they had to change their logo whenever they played there. But again, we got new tracks on this album. Uh, do you have do you have a favorite amongst those, Jay? Yeah, I mean, I, I would, I think, um, I would think like da uh, down on your knees. Um, I, I think, yeah, I would. That's uh, what. What are you? What are you going with? I want to. I, I don't well, want. Mine is nowhere to run. Nowhere to run. Yeah, that is just because it is. It's such an epic song, and it it just like it really again it's it's that building that paul stanley knows how to do with his songs but it's basically about like you broke my heart and you know you just used me to be there but now you're off with somebody else and he's like but you know you're, you're gonna miss me you're gonna wish you know you're still with me but it's just like there's nowhere to run like it's, it's just a great like feeling and he's like he's like screaming it at the girl you know like no way yeah it really is good yeah you're I'm a, man that's a tough one now you got me thinking <laughs> but, I, I don't know I, I gotta think I I like both I I might I might switch up on that okay uh, yeah um so at this point though Creatures of the Night album does not work uh unfortunately nobody was listening there we say everybody was listening with their eyes not their ears they didn't want to hear that we had good songs now they just saw kiss still in makeup after all these years let it go guys you know and so they took off the makeup it was a big stunt mtv they got this whole opportunity to say hey this is what they really look like okay uh, and so finally it was revealed and they looked a little awkward. They were not used to uh, <laughs> having to appear without makeup. Um, that, and it was, that was like, I think you're even like underselling it. It was huge. It was like kisses taking their makeup. And it was like, I think a lot of people thought like, okay, well, it's this is it's a little late to to start pulling yeah. this stunt, but when you're a kid, you're you're like, what? We finally get to see them with no makeup. <laughs> Yeah, and so they had a new look, and they had a new album, and that was Lick It Up, which is, so there they are. If you ever wondered what Kiss looked like without their makeup, at least Gene and Paul, you probably didn't care about Vinny or Eric, <laughs> but but we did. The Kiss fans did. Oh, yeah. Uh, but this album was mostly written by Vinnie Vincent. He like co-wrote all the songs. He, like he was just a machine. He had worked on like television shows. Like he was just a, a songwriter by profession. So it was it was a big charter. They won MTV Music Video Awards for one of their songs uh, that they did, which is a pretty fun song because Paul Stanley's like rapping. Oh yeah. <laughs> um, but so what what is your favorite song on Lick It Up? 
Um, my favorite, hands down, is Exciter. And it's like, the so I think it, it, it's the opening track and it harkens back to Deuce for me because it's just that blistering opening track that uh, you really, I always wondered, I mean, I didn't expect it to be like a big like single, but I thought that that song had a lot more merit and it may, it may even be one of their best songs, period. But it just, no one's ever talking about it. And I feel oh. like it's incredible. <laughs> it really is. All their opening tracks on every 80s album, they're all killer. Like, they're yeah. so good. But yeah. yeah, so Exciter is great. And it's just, it's all energy. And it's like passion and fire, lust and desire. Oh, Exciter. Exciter. <laughs> yeah. So good. <laughs> Great. And of course, I, everybody's probably heard Lick It Up. It was a big hit at the time. It shows up, you know, my friend in high school, actually, my best friend used to say, they just ripped off the Rolling Stones. And I'm like, what are you talking about? He's like, start me up. It's it. Start me up. Yeah. Start me up. Lick it up. Start me up. <laughs> yeah. Lick it up. It's totally different. He's like, no, it's the same. I'm like, whatever. <laughs> um, but no, my song is, there's a theme here. It's a Paul Stanley song where he's upset that a girl left him and <laughs> i'm not saying that was my experience in life but i'm saying that like i always love his passion it's a million to one. Ah, oh, so good oh, and it's so, just oh like, he played that uh in, in the solo tour and yeah. it was phenomenal yeah oh, it's so good like yeah and it's just yeah it's it's a, it's a love revenge song you know <laughs> it's basically what it is really good it's so yeah. bombastic <laughs> Dan Abbey. I mean, he, he does a lot of that, but it's good. All right. Yeah. Uh, now their next album, where it's just like, again, we're trying to find what's our new gimmick. What's our new thing that we're going to do? We don't have makeup. We don't have the platforms anymore. We're going to animalize. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so their idea was we are going to now have animal print and we're going to yes. tell people they have to animalize. Uh, by <laughs> By this time, just look at that. Wow. I love it. Oh, it's so good. Post-apocalyptic. So I, Vinny Vincent yeah. had been kicked out of the band at this point. He was too much of a problem. <laughs> and so they got a new singer who we mentioned earlier, a guy named Mark St. John. And he, this was the era of Eddie Van Halen. They needed a shredder. They needed just somebody who could just... You know, just like nonsense, you know, a notes, as many notes as possible. And that's what Mark St. John was known for. Uh, this album has, I mean, their single on it was Heaven's on Fire. Like, so that's a great one. Um, but what is what is your big song for this? I'm going uh, Thrills in the Night. Yeah. Yeah, Thrills in the Night is definitely my, uh, my favorite. And again, this is like just super MTV era where like if you were a band and you had you had big hair and, and you, you could play instruments at, you know, at all like you, and you had a, a video on MTV, like everybody knew who you were. You could be famous. You could, you know, sell albums. You could sell out a, a, an arena. It was a crazy time. And I just felt like those, those videos that they had really kept them going, like just gave them breathe new life. And, uh, like you said, like Heavens on Fire was big, but even a song like Thrills in the Night was like, wow, this is unbelievable, you know? Yeah, Thrills in the Night is great because Paul Stanley produced this album. This is the first time he produces a Kiss album, which he does later on as well. But like just the chorus on Thrills of the Night is just all these layers, just layers and layers of voices. And it just, it sounds amazing. Although for me, it's all about the opening song into the fire i've had enough you know, it's yeah. like in parentheses i've had right enough. <laughs> yeah just in case you weren't aware i've had enough. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it just it just wails in there and it's just got like screeching screaming guitars and like it was written with desmond child who paul Stanley wrote a lot with and he wrote for bon jovi like their biggest yeah. hits and stuff like but it's just it's a great great song and it just gets you into the energy of what this album's going to be unfortunately all of Gene's songs on this album are just unfortunate. Like he didn't yeah. crying. Gene Simmons was in movies at this point. Right. Simmons was in Never Too Young to Die with John yeah. Stamos. He's he's just he's Mr. Hollywood now. He didn't really have time to put it. Yeah. 
Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> You'd run away with Tom Selleck, right? In um, trick or treat. Trick or treat. Man. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, um, I can't not mention that. <laughs> Got to get it in there. Yeah. Um, now, this is, we showed the solo album covers and the Dynasty cover earlier. They were trying to hearken to that again here with their 1985 album, Asylum. Right. Okay. So here they are. This is very like fashion super, magazine. Yeah, MTV. super 80s. Yeah. yeah. Um, but this is another one. I think Paul, yeah, Paul Stanley and Gene both produced this one together. Um, but it's it's like straight ahead. This that, that's the most MTV album, is what I feel like. Like this is like this is what 80s rock is, pop rock. Okay, that's what we're gonna do. Um it, yeah, do it's think? definitely that. Yeah, it's definitely um the 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 really even more so the MTV album than the last one. Um, but I, and I like that you mentioned that because when you look at some of these songs, okay, they've got some songs on this album that, um, and I'm not going to say it's my favorite, but as an example, so secretly cruel could have been on, um, rock and roll over, you know, like there's, there's songs that are like classic kiss and you don't expect it because you're like, I could see the lineage of these of these songs. Uh, and then some of them sound just like within the time frame, you know, so the mid 80s. Right. But I think I, I want to say I want to say uh, all night is my, is my favorite. <laughs> It's, and it had a music video, and yes, it's you work all day and you don't know why. We'll just get into it. You, yeah. you uh, all night. That's that's, yeah. that's what it's all about. Um, but yeah. my, the thing I love about this album, we're saying that Gene was checked out, but on this album, he finally finds his new voice. Because yes. also in the 70s, he was, oh, yeah. You know, yeah. He, had, yeah. he was trying to growl through everything, and then he kept doing that. With you know creatures of the night, they getting even they take the makeup off now. Lick it up. He's still growling. He's still like a, the demon. He's not, but he's not the demon here. Now he he does a lot of like really high, amazing falsetto, super powerful like like screams and stuff that he can get out. Like and it's much smoother for the eighties, but it really is great. And the next album even more so. But secretly yeah. cruel is my pick because what's Gene Simmons want to sing about? I am the ultimate lover. You're going to want to get some of this. And Secretly Cruel is about how women, like, are, you know, a woman, like, like the opening line is like, uh, or I don't know if it's the opening line, but he's like, she had my pictures on the wall. She cut them out of a magazine. You know, so like he's saying, like, there's all these girls who know who I am and they want to be with me, you know? And he's, so it's just, it's it's a great story song, but it, it's got a nice just groove to it. I, yeah, so Secretly Cruel is awesome. But what did you land on then for you? What did you say? All, all night, right? So. Yeah, I I do. I do think that that is, is my favorite. Um, there's a lot of really good ones on there. I it's think. A good, good album. Yeah. Yeah. I think. um yeah, I'm going. I'm gonna. I'm gonna go with uh, all night. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Speaking of the nighttime and kiss, uh, this next one they got produced by a big time producer, and this is probably their best sounding album of the '80s, and that is Crazy Nights. Now, this was a big hit in the UK. Like Crazy Nights apparently was like a really big song, but you look at this. Like they finally got a look down. Like they are just sexing it up. Look at Paul Stanley with his hairy you, chest. Yeah, and shirt. yeah. I mean, it's definitely it's it. It was uh, like you said, it was popular in the UK, but it was very commercially successful. Um, and I remember one thing I, I'll, I'll never forget. Uh, I was at some kind of like big family gathering, um, and it was. It was a, a either 80, I think that came out in 87. It was either 87 or 88. And I was at this thing. It could have been like a communion party, whatever it was. They had a DJ. And I went up to the DJ and I said, can you play Kiss? And I, of course, the whole, the whole party happened. And toward the, like maybe the last few songs, then he's like, oh, you know, I didn't forget about you. And he played Kiss but he played crazy nights and I wasn't upset by it. I gave him, you know, I was like, okay, but I was expecting rock and roll all night. And I'll never forget that because I'm like, clearly he was understanding that this was the latest kiss track, you know? So I just thought that was interesting. 
yeah but it's it's great it's a great like title track like it's a really good anthem which is what kiss was known for and yeah so i mean but like just again the production and the vocal performances on this album like paul stanley never sounded better g never sounded better like better written songs to perform but like just the vocal acrobatics the gymnastics that paul stanley in particular is doing on this yeah album. you're like Woo, yeah you've been, you've been training for this but what's your favorite one overall um i'm gonna go with reason to live which was uh, i think a single for them but it, that's one of those ones where it, it was kind of it was um it wasn't it wasn't necessarily like a hard song it was kind of a room like a ballad you know yeah. which for, but it, it had an edge to it and it was also just like in sort of inspirational i mean it, it was different and i felt like it was probably one of the most mature songs that they had done up until that point you know or at least one that got released as a single yeah it during this time paul stanley was trying to get in to being a songwriter writing his songs selling them to other artists to record make some extra money that way because he and gene were kind of becoming moguls and producing other bands and trying to get stuff going that way but for me again like i say gene in this era was on fire for me thief in the night uh, i love that song like and i i love just yeah. everything about his vocals but it's really tied with uh good girl gone bad for me like just he's sexing it up man he's oh yeah it up, it's singing about the ladies and, and he's so like smooth and awesome and oh you I know mean, yeah it, it's great but the, the funniest thing you know the, on a you know uh good girl gone bad you know she found love in the back of my car is one of the lines ultimately <laughs> you know so it's just kind of funny how that goes speaking of crazy lyrics uh, in 88, they did another Just Greatest Hits album called Smashes, Thrashes, and Hits, but mm -hmm. they released two new singles for it. Uh, and so one was called You Make Me Rock Hard. You can read into that all you want. And then there is Let's Put the X in Sex. Right. Overt. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, man. I, I So this album, I remember I bought it at Sam Goody and it so a lot of and a lot of people may not even realize but there's a couple of the tracks or, or if not all of them are re-recorded with eric carr as the drummer which is interesting because all the albums that were released with those songs you know ha are they obviously didn't have eric so you're mm -hmm. like you really can hear the difference in the sound and it's in in some instances it's not, it's not like, um, I'm not going to say it, it's bad. It's just when you first hear it, you're like, this sounds different and you're not yeah. used to it. Right. But when you really listen to it, it sounds better, but then they're just using the mixes, the rest of the, they're all old mixes with new drums, you know? Although, although they also, the thing you listen for that I love, especially on Love Gun, I always hear it because during their live shows during this era in the eighties, you had to have a synthesizer right synthesizer music. so like all the tracks also have a synthesizer track laid in with it and it's yes. awesome <laughs> it's so awesome and and that was another thing too like with uh and i don't want to go on a tangent but eric helped them and they all sort of started playing like when they played their live shows much faster yeah uh and that's one of the things where uh you know i think this kind of just captures the band a little bit better but on those two tracks don't get a lot of love I love both of them so much. And I mean, I, I, it's hard to pick, but I'll go X and sex just because Yeah, I don't know if you've ever seen the footage of the kiss convention with the little kid. Yeah. He's doing like the motion and everything. Yeah. There's like, a little girl who knows <laughs> yeah. all the words to let's put the X and she's doing sex. like the X with her arms yeah. and everything. Oh, man. <laughs> Yeah, that, that was, the video for that is just so much fun. But that was what they were trying to do, like, in the 80s also. They're like, well, we don't have makeup. We're going to be the most, like, like overtly sexual and offensive band. And, like, they're they're cussing from the yeah. stage and saying, oh, oh, yeah. You're like, what are you guys doing? This is, yeah. like, it was, it was, they were trying way too hard. Uh, but yeah. speaking of trying not hard enough in a lot of fans' eyes, Hot in the Shade. <laughs> okay, this this is their album from 1989. And a lot of fans don't like it because it was just a bunch of demos that they, they just said, 
we have to give them an album. Here's the songs we've been working on. They'll be a little bit polished, but not really. And they just kind of threw them in there. And I personally, I had this on cassette. I used to listen to this album in my mom's car when she was taking me back and forth from school all the time. Like oh, yeah. I loved this album to the point where when I, I got a chance to audition for a TV show, it was oh, a wow. lipstick game show uh, that was called uh, The Great Pretenders. And oh, so okay. You had to go in. It was on the Fox Family Channel. Some people saw it. But basically, like, you had to audition, like, lip sync. And they just set up a video camera. And you had, so that was the song I picked, Silver Spoon from yes. Hot in the Shade. It's a Paul Stanley song about, you know, I don't come for money, but I'm still going to, you know, kind of be great. And I can show you I matter. And so I'm just, like, doing all the Paul moves. And I'm, you know, just dancing <laughs> around for the camera. And it's still, like... I love that song so much. That's why I picked it. That's yeah. amazing. <laughs> I love that. Oh, man. Um, I think, you know, for me, I'm probably going to just be kind of basic and say, I, well, I want to say rise to it because of. Yeah, tell about the video. Real the quick. video. Yeah, they get to go back in makeup momentarily, which. When you're a fan and that happens in this video, you're like, no way. Like, it's really, this stuff is meaningful to the fans. I, I It probably gets lost on other people. But, you know, like you said, those things happen as you're moving along and you're following the band. You're seeing these things happen. And, and they really do it. Uh, and it really means something to the fan. So, but I'm I'm gonna go. Yeah, I'm gonna go to rise to it. I'm gonna I'm gonna be the basic person and say that. Oh, uh, it, it's a good song, and it's it's the one that feels the most polished. It's the most produced of all the stuff out there. But there's some great stuff. They get back with Vinnie Vincent. Gene writes a song called Betrayed, which is really cool. Uh, but speaking of cool, oh, the coolest kiss revenge yes. okay guys this album they're in the 90s now okay this is early 90s they're ready to just bring back what was kiss how was kiss dangerous well, black leather look at this metal literal metal on the cover okay they get back with bob ezrin one more time oh so good yeah um, this album my yeah. thing about it is that when they talk about it it's that bob ezrin said gene what are you doing? Why are you Mr. Hollywood? Why are you like, just like dancing and prancing? You're the demon. You're supposed to be dangerous. We're going to yeah. make you dangerous again. Yeah. And so unholy is the opening track on this. Oh my and God. Not seen the music video for unholy. Look it up on YouTube right now. You're just like, wow, this is what I always thought kiss was. This, right. is what, this is what the parents were afraid of. Exactly. Eight. Yeah. And the fact that, and this is what I was kind of getting at with the, the fact that they keep evolving through all these, all these eras. Um, this song in particular really illustrates that in a great way, because this is, um, you know, a 1992, I believe. Yep. Or yeah, somewhere. Yeah. So when you look at that and you're like, wow, this is a, for that time, for a mainstream rock song it was really hard and you know borderline demonic lyrics and all this and like this is probably harder than any gene simmons song up until that point you know like even harder than like god of thunder you know yeah. i'm like wow this is like intense and again it it still had that kind of groove that when you break it down it's it's just unbelievable but then again the whole album like you said it, there was some they were doing a lot of raunchy theatrics on stage and they'd you know take it off and the girls were dancing and stuff a lot of a lot of stuff like that and then um you know domino was was phenomenal god gave rock and roll to you it's so hard to pick a favorite even heart of chrome is is an unbelievable yeah. song uh so wow it is it's difficult for me to to pick but i i do think i would go unholy yeah I, yeah it's, it's, it's hard, undeniable it's hard to, yeah. mm -hmm. uh we should say just for bad history so at this point unfortunately eric carr got heart cancer right eric carr died just before this album was released they yeah. replaced him uh with a, a guy named eric singer who more about him in a bit but eric singer was a great drummer he had played with alice cooper he had done a lot of great stuff um but so yeah so 
they actually on this album they release a something called car jam 1981 which was from like while they were recording the elder demos yeah. and it was like this like they said it's the only drum solo that eric carr ever recorded but live he did these amazing drum solos oh he had like, amazing electronic pads and all this stuff and yes so, and it's a great song i love that jam and so they they just have that going in there so that this is kind of a tribute to him um but then they also decided, okay, well, we've had all these songs through the 80s that we've added to our repertoire. We have to do a Kiss Alive 3 now, uh, which is, yeah, just a lot of great songs on here. Um, is there any, like, particular arrangement that jumps out to you from Alive 3? Well, I I think, when I think of that, the first thing I think of is the Star Spangled Banner. Um, and, and, and it's funny. So I'm wearing, I mean, it's hard to see, but I'm wearing, uh, like, a Revenge-style shirt yeah uh, so wow. like yeah and the thing is since i mean they're a new york band and the uh the stage show for for that there's this giant statue of liberty in the background um and and that for me was was kind of cool because they were always known for a big stage show and that really stood out to me. They always have really amazing imagery. Like you showed Hot in the Shade before. It's gonna, the Sphinx with the sunglasses. Like I love all this. Like but that all this tour, stuff. they had a giant Sphinx. Head oh yeah, on stage like yeah. gigantic. And this like, one, the Statue of Liberty, the face would pop off. Oh well, yeah, like a Terminator like, face. Underneath. Yeah, it was so cool. I loved it. <laughs> so and then like they're like you said, they're kind of finding their way again. But you know and still being those characters playing this awesome music and yeah. they did uh the star spangled banner which i just the whole everything about it was was cool and that's you know bruce kulik uh and everything just yeah and we, and we should mention oh, we've got all yeah. this time in the 80s we didn't mention yeah mark st john only lasted for animalized that he got this issue with his hand called writer's syndrome where he couldn't actually play because his hand was all swelled up so bruce kulik came in because bob kulik was a friend of the band he's like my brother he should he should come in and bob kulik had played on killers and done a bunch of other stuff on paul's solo album so they said oh yeah my brother should play for you so bruce kulik was there with them from 1984 like all the way up to this point in the 90s and he's just look he's not the most expressive guy facially but with a guitar like he really just like shreds and he always could just like find the trend of the moment and work it into what they were doing and he's just it's just a fantastic addition to the band he was there longer than ace freely yeah band, you know yeah but so and then at this point they're kind of like okay you mentioned the kiss conventions they're like we could be a nostalgia act on some level it's trying to be new and relevant isn't working let's do kiss conventions and, and we're going to get people to come around but as part of that also they're like let's show people what we mean to pop culture and to rock music and let's get all the popular bands of the 90s to record our songs the popular bands that are fans of us and let's do this album here, which my friends and I, we used to call it Kiss My A Money Money because the the S's have a weird thing on yeah. it. Yeah. It. <laughs> like it, it doesn't look like an S. I think they did that on purpose. But but when you look at the the bands that were on this album, just look at it, Garth Brooks, Anthrax, Gin Blossoms. I brought up Extreme. They closes with the Mighty Mighty Boss Tones doing Detroit Rock City, like ska yeah. music. Like, yeah. What? I yep. mean, it, so I, first, and just on my own preference, I'm not even really a big fan of cover songs in general. So like when this came out, I was like, ah, I would have loved to have another Kiss album. Yeah, I, I, but of course I'll take, I bought whatever they put out. So I, but I'm actually a huge Anthrax fan. So that's like, you know, just by default, I, I liked their version of She. Uh, and they're actually really big Kiss fans, so yeah, it was very was faithful awesome. to the original version. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah, um, I I already brought up Strutter. That's probably my favorite, just because Extreme at the end they they start meshing into other Kiss songs, and they do kind of a medley, and so they do Shout It Out Loud, they do God of Thunder, and like all this stuff. Like it, it's really fun. So I I love that one. Um, but then. 
at this point, because they were at these conventions doing acoustic sets and they were getting a lot of attention for that, all of a sudden MTV's got this new thing they're doing called Unplugged and they invite Kiss to do a concert. But the real excitement behind this concert was that it was the first time that Ace Freely and Peter Chris had played with Gene and Paul in all these years, you know, like since they each left the band at their assigned time, this was the reunion on this album. But also it showed you how solid the Kiss songs were, that they could be played acoustic and they worked. Like they, were, they were awesome songs. It, absolutely. I totally agree. I'm glad you said that. It's It's hearing how great the music is finally getting uh giving the credit to to kiss for saying wow these these songs are really tremendous they're well well written well put together uh you know well orchestrated and uh seeing them stripped down to just the bare bones uh just unbelievable because uh and then also like you said they all got together so it was it was great i mean to see ace ace and peter come back but then all of them playing together at one time with, Two you know, drum sets, was, both drummers like, yeah. playing at the same time. My <laughs> mind, everybody's like heads exploded. You know, you got to be kidding me. It's like unbelievable. Yeah, so, I mean, it's so like they're so great. Like what they're doing, what they're how they're able to arrange everything. My favorite performance, vocal performance, is Paul Stanley. I still love you. Oh yeah, unbelievable. And again, he's just he's giving it everything, and at one point he just holds out this note for so long and you're just like what oh know? yeah so i don't know if you've ever and i might have mentioned it but there's um if you if you get the tape i have a tape like an actual vhs tape oh, yeah. of of the actual event they had to play those songs like four or five times each mm -hmm. so like you're like the ones that made it to the lot to the actual broadcast Man, I don't, of course they're like losing their voices now because, my God, putting all that heart and soul into it. Ugh. Well, and it's oh funny, like in between on the Kissology set, they have a lot of like the deleted tracks also where they show you like in between songs, they're doing like, you know, God of Thunder country style. Yes. You know, yeah. yeah. <laughs> just whatever, like just for fun, you know, just messing yeah. around. So, yeah. Um. So at this point, though, Unplugged goes well. They decide, you know what? people like us again we've shown them what we were they want that they want the classic kiss they get ace and peter to agree to join up they spend a lot of time training get them back in shape because ace and peter had kind of been touring off and on unsuccessfully with their solo stuff so now they're back everybody's back 1996 they're launching a world tour they announce it on a battleship in like the New York Harbor, Conan O'Brien introduces them. <laughs> yes, <laughs> of yeah. People. And now yeah. Kiss is back. They but they first reveal themselves on the MTV Video Music Awards. Tupac Shakur. <laughs> I think it, I think it was I think it was the American Music Awards. Oh, is that what it was? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah Tupac. Yeah, he introduces them, and they came out because like you hadn't seen them in makeup and in gear for years. You know, so you're like, wow, this is unbelievable. But yeah, uh, it was on the USS Intrepid. And they, it was so bizarre, but awesome at the same time because it was very New York. Yeah. So so they get back together. And it ends up being the most successful tour of that year, the highest grossing concert act of that year. Um, so and they they go on, you know, 96, 97. And so it was very, very like they they suddenly were everywhere. You were just hearing about Kiss again. They're on the newsstands. They're on TV. Like they played New Year's Rocket Eve with Dick Clark. I remember staying up late to watch them play the, you know, for New Year's Eve. That was awesome. Um, so but, awesome. So they get together. They do all that. But while that's happening, they had one more album they were working on with the Revenge Era group. And it was called Carnival of Souls. I don't know what happened to my booklet. I lost my booklet. But oh, this was man. like a super like grudge Seattle. They're trying to be Soundgarden. They they want you know to have a little bit of I don't know. There's probably some Jade's Addiction mixed in some Smashing Pumpkins, like whatever they can can get going there. Alice in Chains vibes. So it's a very not kiss at all nothing you've ever heard well you know i think uh, you know what i think is uh, the 
the great thing about that album is it goes along like more with that theme about the evolution of this band and how they keep trying to like roll with the times so when you look at revenge and they tried to keep up with the like the hard rock vibe in that era if they would have not gotten back together with the original band that was they because they held that back from getting released because yeah. they knew they were getting back with the guys if they would have put that out in maybe in 93 or you know or 94 it probably would have i'm not gonna say hit bigger but it would have made more sense and it would say oh this sounds like they're just keeping up with the with the joneses right now you know yeah and i was very confused at the time because this is literally when i'm getting into kiss they're back there's a greatest kiss album that comes out there's you wanted the best you got the best that i'd be <laughs> yeah. introduced to them so i'm learning all about classic kiss then i'm buying all the albums and then all of a sudden they're without makeup and they're yeah. playing the super hard rock grunge well band. you know it's it, it was so weird at that time because i had a cassette bootleg of that for like a long time before that ever came out i would say maybe maybe two maybe a year and a half almost two years or so maybe more than that uh because like that it was out it, it was basically released in under you know on the on the black market to yeah. uh kiss fans so we had it but it was it wasn't all the final mixes and stuff so but i have to say when they put that out i was like wow this this is a great album i, I it loved it because it was the first new kiss album that had come out since i became a fan so right oh new songs and i and hate is like the number one it's yeah. just it's like the sequel to unholy yeah it's, it's so good it's it's a song about the holocaust i mean and Gene's mom was a Holocaust survivor. So yeah. Like he's singing about all this stuff that went down, but it's like, it's great. Like it's so heavy and it just pulls he you. He is good. And uh, Childhood's End is really good, you know? Um, mm -hmm. And that, I just think it's uh, very underrated. But I think, like you said, if it is a C, I look at it as a sequel to Unholy 2. But if you would have think, you, you would have seen that album come out directly after Revenge is the way it was supposed to be, yeah. it would have made more sense. Absolutely. Yeah. So finally, big tour. Everything's going great for them. They're on top of the world. Let's get back in the studio. How about the original four members record an album together? What's it going to be called? Psycho Circus. Psycho Circus. Yes. yes. Lenticular oh, yeah. album cover here. I mean, this was like such a big deal to me. I remember literally going with my friends lunchtime on our lunch break we ran over to the music store the warehouse and we got our copies of psycho circus and popped it into you know the cd player as soon as we could listen to as many tracks as we could before we had to go back to class we're just oh, like i yeah. can't believe it oh yeah i mean i i get i was like i was stoked i bought mine at nobody beats the whiz yeah <laughs> <laughs> but yeah it was really such an, an event it was big, big, and the title track is just a classic, instant classic when it came out, Psycho Circus. My band, with my guys that got me into KISS, we formed a band. That was a song we played at a school talent show. We played it at our concerts. Like, we just, we loved it. I had a little pyro thing I set up on my oh, mic. You know, those party so, popper yeah. shit. <laughs> like 20 of those together, and I taped all the strings together. And when I would jump out, I'd pull it, and it looked like streamers <laughs> were coming out of my mouth. That's so cool. <laughs> so, I love that. We love we loved that album so much. I mean, just all, it, it's there's kind of a, a disparate amount of tunes on there. There's kind of some weird ones mixed yeah, in. Yeah, yeah. But it's still got some great tracks overall, I would say. So, yeah, definitely. Uh, but good things can't last forever. And uh, ultimately, there was a farewell tour. Okay. As <laughs> Ace and Peter were not happy again and they wanted out of the band and they were causing trouble. So they toured with Aerosmith and they, they kind of did this double bill thing. And then it was over. It was a sad end. Um, and then they, they got a replacement, which was Eric Carr, or not Eric Carr, Eric Singer is coming back and he's going to be in the Catman makeup. And that was like, everybody's like, no, yeah. that's Peter's makeup. You can't do it. And that yeah. was like 
a huge thing. He dyed his hair black because he was a blonde guy and his hair is dyed black now. And he's the cat man. And everybody's like, what? No. And then Ace, you know, left a little bit after once again. And they get this guy coming in named Tommy Thayer. Yeah. Thayer had been like their tour manager for the conventions. He'd just been behind the scenes. He was in a band called Black and Blue that Gene had produced in the 80s. And his debut was on this Kiss Symphony Alive 4 where they played their songs with the live symphony copying metallica yes but yeah yeah <laughs> that was their thing to do and they really didn't announce him they're just like uh ace is here yeah, yeah. Like, <laughs> guy in the ace makeup the spaceman is playing and he can play just like ace oh yeah that would be different yeah he he's he and he was a huge fan also of like he just knows everything about he knows all the all the notes note for note so i mean and he played more like Ace than Ace did at that right. point. And that's why I was so happy when he came in the band. I was not mad. I was just like, Ace had kind of given up again on trying. Oh, yeah. I, so one time I was in uh, Vegas and I was, I don't know if you heard of the band Steel Panther. Yeah. So they had, um, I, just as a special guest, he came up to play with them. And oh. I, so I was like front and center. The place was like half empty. And, uh, I, but I'm like right there, like, He's just, he is just putting on a show. They're letting him do solos the whole night. Just like, it was just amazing. He's a talented guy. He really is. Yeah. So, so then they, you know, they're on tour for a while, you know, with, with this, this incarnation of the band becomes the band for the next 20 years until the end, the literal end of the band. And, and they're great. And, but they decide we're going to get back in the studio and they're going to release another album after all, I mean, Psycho Circus was 1998. This was 2009. Sonic Boom. Yes. Okay. Uh, this was like touted as like a return to form. Like we're gonna we're gonna be the old kiss again. Everything that you you recognize and remember about our sound. And again, Tommy Thayer knew how to play like the classic kiss guitar. And he just brought so much to the band by doing that. That sound that had been missing. Bruce was great. Vinny was bombastic, but it was just like, we want it to sound like what we love. And he does it. Um, I mean, modern day Delilah is top three kiss song for me of all time. I could listen to it on a loop forever and never get tired of it. And especially Tommy Thayer's solo. Yeah. That. And it was so good. I totally agree. Uh, so when that uh, when they put the clip, it was like a thirty second clip uh, out on Kiss Online on their website. Uh, like, here's our new song coming out, and I listened. I did. I just kept listening to it over and over and over. Just that thirty seconds of it, you know. And then finally, when it came out, I'm like, forget this song is awesome, you know. It's so it's so good. Now I also say Tommy Thayer sings a song on this album. And it's called uh, "When Lightning Strikes." And yeah, it, it's a fun song. He he only got ever to record two Kiss songs, but they're both really great. Like I think they're both talented. really good. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I, in fact, I I like I like "Out of This World" even probably better. You know? Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. Speaking of which, so the final Kiss album, we finally arrived. This was their album, Monster. Okay? Yeah. And yeah. this is this is at a point where like. They had been touring for so long. I mean, they've they've just been giving it their all, touring the world. This is the band, you know, we're going to do one more album together. This album is a mixed bag. It's got yeah. some weird tracks on it. They have like a track where they do like some acapella, like barbershop almost singing. Yeah, yeah. Where you're like, mm, I don't know about that. But by the same token, like it, it, it has some interesting things on it that, the Hell or Hallelujah was their single, but it's it's just okay. Um, yeah. I, I think I always go with it because it's the last gasp of the demon, which is the devil is me. The devil is me. Yeah, yeah like, it, it it definitely, that had a an old school gene feel. Uh, surprisingly though, and I know you, everyone thinks I'm nuts, like everyone who I tell this to, I think back to the stone age is an awesome underrated song because if like if you really think about it you listen to it and that it's very gene and it's almost like when you really you listen to the lyrics it's unexpectedly awesome 
I think. You, you got to get into it, you know? Yeah, it's it's a very powerful song. It's just a pounding song. Yeah. Right, yeah. Which is great. And I, I like, uh, Paul has a song on it called Freak. Freak is, is really good, yeah. Yeah, it's a, it doesn't sound like a Kiss song, but it's right. a cool song. I agree. Uh, but yeah, so with that, Kiss was done recording studio albums, and then they just... Uh, called it quits uh, i was there i went to the other uh, to that tour we'll get into that here slowly but that that was the the entire kiss catalog there's a few other import things and things mixed you know uh here and there but i did want to ask you because the band members came and went to you know gene and paul were there the whole time and even gene and paul did solo albums and solo tours at certain points took a little breaks do you have a favorite solo album? Do or do you think one of them excelled more than the others in the solo realm? Um, I mean, I think the the solo, you know, like "Live to Win," that era when when Paul, you know, did that whole thing. Like, I thought I really enjoyed a lot of that. Um, I, I mean, I wasn't too too crazy about like. I know Gene had uh, the one uh, solo album that got it, it had a it had one track that was was fairly fairly got some good airplay I would say but I mean neither of them really hit too big with me I was just happy to see like Paul on tour and and doing his solo stuff so I mean to get him back on tour I was happy with it but yeah I like like Live to Win like this the track that track was pretty good um, but I mean overall I was never like going crazy over them. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it was kind of hit or miss here and there. The one who had, like, definitely the, and still has, like, the largest volume of solo albums is Ace Freely. Uh, but I like his first step because he formed a band called Freely's Comet in the mid-'80s. And uh, specifically, I like uh, Second Sighting, which is the sequel yeah. uh, to, to his first album. Uh, but I I found that album every year my dad would take me on the same trip to visit my grandparents. It was the same vacation every summer. And there's this little town in Utah. It's actually where I did find that kiss script. So it wasn't all bad, but there was a music store and I went in there and they had cassette tapes. And I'm just looking through, is there any kiss? There's no kiss, but Freely's comment. There can't be another Freely in music that I, and I pull it out. I'm like, this is an Ace Freely album, you know? And I just, I loved it because he had a singer he sang songs, but he had another singer songwriter in the band, Todd Howarth, who had an amazing voice and was a great like guitar player and songwriter himself. So the two of them like going back and forth, you know, track for track, like I I, I loved Freely's Comet. And then Ace eventually releases an album called Anomaly, uh, which I really like because it's a lot of demos from the Freely's Comet era that he then like finished at that time and so yeah so i think ace like wins the solo wars for me even though live to it is a fun album but yeah, yeah. gene and peter's stuff no yeah it, nah. it's an invasion no <laughs> yeah nah. <laughs> all right well we got to close this thing out because we we just we we went through all the decades of kiss uh, but what uh, the, the Kiss experience is going live. You know, you got to see them live. So I'm just curious, what was your first Kiss concert like? And how many times do you think you've seen them overall live? So, yeah, I, I've been seeing them since I was probably like maybe in maybe in high school or middle school, I think. Um, but I've I, I've seen them the uh, every every tour they've come around i've i've gone to since i would say the the 90s so i would it has to be god i don't know holy moly i can't even count how many times i've seen them uh but again like there's been times like in one tour sometimes i would go to two different shows or you know stuff like that so i mean it has to be like maybe 30 some odd times that i've seen them yeah that's awesome. Do you remember like the first one? Was it Psycho Circus or was it a different? Was it the the reunion tour? Or what was it? it no, it was before. Yeah, it was before that. Um, I mean, it was before not Psycho Circus. It was uh -huh. it was probably the reunion tour. Yeah, okay. yeah. That's awesome. Um, yeah, I think. How about you? Uh, well, yeah. So I I I've seen them like twelve times. I think I've counted overall. So I've tried to go as often as I could. But like Sonic Boom tour, I think I saw them like four or five times on that tour on both coasts. I went to California. I went to Jersey. I saw them in Phoenix. I saw them just like every time I could see them because I love that album so much. I wanted to hear those songs live. Um, 
but my first concert uh this is kind of funny let me see if i can find my stuff here um because you know i i was all on board i told you about psycho circus and then halloween night kiss at dodger stadium oh uh, yes so this nice. is the, you know the original newspaper ad it was in 3d you got 3d yep. glasses put your glasses on they tell you put your 3d glasses on and they they played the video <laughs> smashing pumpkins opened for them and they had a psycho circus i think their original plan was to have one at every stop on the tour but i don't think that happened but they had like people like throwing up like they were like drinking stuff and then like throwing up they had people like on a bed of nails they had like you know the motorcycle guys and the steel ball going around they had people getting launched and you know people hanging stuff from their earlobes like it was just it was crazy like the pre-show of what was going on but i just i'd never been to a kiss concert i'd never been to a real rock concert i'd seen weird al a couple times so that was it you know so i was just like this is amazing and my friends and i we just we lived for this moment. We were all the way in the back, like literally in the back, but it was still too loud. They yeah. they had cr it cranked so high. <laughs> oh yeah, it so, was it's a loud show. But the, but they were broadcast on Fox that night. They were on Mad TV and they were showing pieces of the concert while it was going. So eventually, I found this bootleg and I was able to get that. Yeah, so that that's so missing. cool. Yeah, that's awesome. This is my this is my my favorite keepsake, you know, from that. But I. You know, this is my shirt with them at Dodger awesome. Stadium, but the back was just great with the jack o' lanterns. You know, oh, great! Yeah, those that's phenomenal. I yeah, love that. So, so that that was just a great, great experience to to and seeing everybody in costume, see everybody in the face paint. So you you've done how many times have you done the face paint? <laughs> oh yeah, I've done. I was like, uh, even when I was a kid, we used to have like masquerade parties at like the schools. So I would always dress as Gene Simmons. And like one time I won a scariest costume because I would just be like walking around and like have the blood capsules like dripping out of my mouth, uh, you know, uh, it was, it, I think I, I'm, I've dressed up as Gene Simmons more times than I can remember, but I, I feel like it, I relate to that character, you know, because it's that horror vibe. So I like that. Yeah. Like I've, anytime there's been a face painting booth, like I went to Universal Studios once and there was a face painting booth. And I said, make me Paul Stanley, you know, because I always had a picture of the band in my wallet. It was pre-internet and cell phones and stuff. I'm like, make me look like this guy. And he did it. <laughs> and then like, I went to another, it was like, it was like a church, you know, fair of some sort. They were doing a booth. I'm like, make me Ace Freely. I literally went and grabbed the solo album, like CD. And I'm like, make me this guy. You know, and I went to a Halloween costume as Gene, you know, and never yeah. done Peter. Because even yeah. Peter Chris doesn't want to be Peter Chris, <laughs> as we've learned. Um, but uh, do you, whether it's one you attended or just have seen, is there a favorite live performance of the band? Like where you like, oh, they were so cool when they did this, or just a favorite tour that you're aware of? Yes. So I, I'm a huge fan of, well, I was, it's not one I was at, but uh, I'm a huge fan of very, very early kiss. And um, when they played, uh, when they played in, so in Jersey city here in New Jersey, there was um, a stadium called Roosevelt stadium. And you could find this. It's like, you can find the whole concert um you could probably get it like on dvd i mean it's it's you could probably get it on youtube but it's like a pristine uh recording oh. uh it, it's in i believe it's in black and white if i'm not mistaken because it's you know it was very early on i mean it might have been 70 five okay could be 75 um and you know it's just it's a it's an early early uh aspect of the band but it's a great show, and I do. I just like early Kiss a lot, especially even when you see like when they were first on TV or getting that first exposure. So stuff like that. Like I love when Gene used to have that like skull on his shirt and the two little horns on his jacket. Yeah. And that like, oh man, I that's that's my Kiss. I love all that, you know, just because it was so like you like when you're from this area, there used to be a big rock scene where a lot of bands would try to break out now. I mean, not so much now, but back in the day, LA, like in the eighties was yeah. big. 
but New York in the seventies was incredible. I mean, not only punk, you had metal, you had hard rock. I mean, even pop bands, just everybody like Madonna came through, like she was from Michigan, but she got popular because of New York city clubs and stuff. So um, I would say, you know, anything like that early kiss uh, local would be my favorite. Oh, that's awesome. I, I don't. So, so I went to San Diego Comic-Con in 97. It was the only time I've ever gone. And the only thing I bought there was Kiss merchandise. Okay. So I was there. I went to the McFarland booth so that I could buy my uh, Kiss yes. figures. I had to yes. have them. Right. Um, and so I actually, the interesting thing just about that, you see there, you know, people in the know there originally they were released with a kiss letter so each band yeah. had one letter you could put it together and then they did like the re-release where they had their solo albums a mini reproduction in there uh, so right for fun so but i walked away that's what i spent my money on four kiss figures and a bootleg vhs of their first reunion concert because it took place in my hometown it was at Irvine Meadows. It was the yeah. K-Rock Weenie Roast, which was this mm -hmm. big festival. They yeah, the, the radio station, right? Yeah. yeah. So and so that was their first like you know demo show, basically. Like we've been practicing. Let's see how this goes. And so it, it eventually was released as a bonus disc on the Kissology DVD. Uh, but they edited out all the Spinal Tap like problems they had with costumes, with lighting, the pyro effects literally went off like before the show was over and caught on fire and this whole like big area is on fire and paul's just like we got a fire up there <laughs> maybe we'll burn this place down <laughs> like it's so great like it, there's just all these like it's there's a looseness when it's filmed from the crowd because it's a total bootleg but it was like multiple cameras they fade in they fade out and that like is my favorite performance you just feel the energy because again people hadn't seen them they hadn't seen it yeah. yeah it's been so long it's like just getting that magic back and it really did feel like wow this is like it's like because you know why it was almost like a time machine being because they really didn't change all that like the the stage show was similar yeah. the look was very i mean they didn't look that bad for a bunch of old men <laughs> yeah they got back in shape so yeah. all right well the final thing we have to get into here we've, we've dropped it here and there going to spencer's gift spencer's gifts was the place to find kiss merchandise all through the 90s like it, it was insane there was also these catalogs that I that I used to order from all the time. In fact, this one's hilarious because right there they actually offer a Kiss Psycho Circus ad with a ticket stub, with your you know 3D glasses on the backstage pass, all this stuff. Yeah, oh, fifty dollars. I saved myself one hundred fifty dollars. Yeah. <laughs> Made my own. I uh, like that. But yeah, but they, they just had so much cool stuff that you could buy. Yeah. But ultimately, whether it's something you bought at the time or something you found later on, like what's your most prized like Kiss collectible that you've that you've been able to add to your collection at some point? Right. Yeah, and I think that's one of the cool things about Kiss because you got like the collectible part of it is a great aspect. I have a, I have a couple things. Okay. Um, so I'll play show and tell real quick. Um, <laughs> so this is the guitar hero gene simmons axe bass wow um, and uh like it's it's i've always like i was always a big fan of guitar hero because i you know i i just had a lot of fun with it i'm not a big gamer but i'm like man if i can get the axe bass this is going to be phenomenal you know uh i got um this is a glow in the dark uh brazil copy brazilian copy of yeah. uh and it's got you'll notice oh they added got, Vinny. yeah 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 and it's got Vinny there yeah so that thing, <laughs> and it glows in the dark from it's actually from 1983 yeah that's great yeah um and you know i mean i can go on and on but i do have um i'll show you one last thing yeah yeah okay all right so this is yes this is, uh the demon the big giant demon uh it's it's this huge they had huge dolls like the, these big dolls uh i mean for lack of a better term there it's not a statue it's, it's not really a doll either it's like a it's, giant action figure yeah. it's a giant actually it's got real hair 
Uh, but I remember when you would go to like a lot of the kiss convention stuff, you'd see some of them, like uh, people would have them up on the top of their right. booths and stuff. Yeah. yeah. Even at Spencer's when I saw them, they had them on the upper shelf. Yeah. Yeah. Plays yeah. God of Thunder, right? Plays God of Thunder. Yeah. And then they did like a second wave with, like the different costumes and stuff, but oh, yeah, the this... love gun. Yeah, they started with destroyer, then did love gun. Yeah. yeah, and this one in particular. I mean, I'd obviously love to have them all, but th this one I always wanted to have, so it's like one of my prize things. That's so great. I've always wanted those too. I've always yeah. like, well, I come across them in the wild somewhere. Yeah, but... yeah, yeah. That's great. Oh, yeah. um, so one thing I'll just say, I do have this. I, I wasn't able to pull it out, but I did get a Kiss Visa card. No way. So I totally have one. It has my name on it, and this That's was awesome. This huge. <laughs> so cool. <laughs> Actually, awesome. he just wants me to spend all my money on him. Okay. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so I'll, I'll I'll listen to you. Um. So the other thing though was. My nephew, you know, again, my family, all my friends know I love Kiss, right? That's just the way the way that they know me. And so one birthday, just out of nowhere, my nephew sent me this. Yes. So for those who don't know, you know, Jay mentioned it briefly earlier. This is from 1977. Uh, this is the Kiss Super Special. But if you look here, it's printed in real Kiss blood. Yes. So they literally had their blood drawn. It was dumped into the ink vats for the printings of this. And so this was so special to me to have that because, you know, in the 90s, I was collecting the Kiss Psycho Circus comic book. You know, I had you on my Wizards podcast. We talked all about that. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then in the, in the early 90s and the late 80s, they had these kind of bootleg kiss yeah right. <laughs> and then even when the reunion tour happened marvel produced this kiss nation book mm -hmm. um, but you just you can't beat the original I the mean, original yeah that one and then the one that came after it was was really cool too but yeah that's that's the original one and for a long time i don't i don't know the cost on it now but i remember when i first got that it was worth a lot of money it it, it went up pretty high back then yeah, yeah. It's one of those things because and that's the thing. Like, you know, I told you I showed you all those magazines I got, and I used to have like a Kiss Art 2 Kiss Army membership kit folders that one of the you know people at my high school who was a kid in the 70s, he's like, You're a Kiss fan? This is amazing. Why don't you take my old Kiss stuff? And oh, I was just yeah. like, What? You know, sure. so like, but that's not my era. So those I usually sell so that a fan from you know 20 years before us can have their childhood back. So like those magazines I have, I'm gonna sell, you know, like so I don't know. The super special I think I'm gonna keep because that's awesome. But you know, yeah. it's just, it's yeah. just one of those things where you're just kind of like, oh, you know, it's 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 awesome that every fan can have their era. You know, there's been so many eras to be a Kiss fan. And now we're going into now that they've stopped touring, they've stopped recording albums. We're going to get virtual Kiss. Uh, it's it's what is unbelievable. What's it going to be? We, <laughs> we have... Oh, yeah. I mean, I'm in however they can keep extending it. Uh, I'm in. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. For sure. So, uh, well, Jay, so much more we could be getting into, but I'm just, I'm so glad that we've gotten a chance to talk all this time. Uh, I mean, it's getting late for you, but the enthusiasm is still there, obviously. Uh, last question. Just what do you think is the main reason that you've remained a KISS fan? Like that it, ha it wasn't just a fad for a time. I'm, well, I, first and foremost, the music, because I mean, really, if the music wasn't as good as as good as it it is, I think that would be uh, it wouldn't you know it'd just be like a flash in the pan. But uh, it's it's a hobby. It's a it's a whole it's a whole culture. It's a subculture, right? And the uh, not only the uh, superhero aspect, the horror aspect, the music, the rock and roll, like it's just the the camaraderie with other fans. You could do so there's cosplay there's i mean it's everything rolled in it's literally everything rolled into one and uh i think that is part of why it sustains uh but when we meet if, you know if you meet another kiss fan or you're somewhere out and you see someone with a kiss you, hey nice shirt you're best friends you're just like I, i've never met a kiss fan honestly i've never met a kiss fan i don't like because 
usually you'll go to a concert. Everyone's always trying to prove their fandom and brag and whatnot. Kiss fans are, we're all Kiss fans and we're all in the same boat. And I never really see that. It's not like people are trying to compete with each other or whatever. I, I've, I've never had a bad experience in that respect. So um, overall, just it's an experience. Um, and I, I think it's, it, it actually kisses one of the greatest parts of my life so far, to be honest. Yeah. And I, I feel the same way. Like it's added so much, you know, like you say, the camaraderie is there, the music is there, the entertainment value, but it's just, there is a message that kiss has developed over time. Now, the first message, if you're talking to Gene is buy my stuff, give me your money. Like <laughs> yeah. he literally will say that he doesn't mind saying that. Right. Yeah. And they're, they're honest with you, but also Gene and Paul, especially they really appreciate the fans. Like they are honest about it. They're like, yes, we're cashing in on your fandom, but we're delivering what you want. We right. You're what you want. We're still touring because you still want us to be there. You know, like you're, you're still supporting us. So we're not just going to give up and relax and just take your money from, you know, merchandise, you know, we're going to give you a show. Um, but also, They've really, like, through their autobiographies, just through, like, interviews you hear, it, they want people, they're just like, believe in yourself. You know, like, th whatever difficulty you have in life, you could overcome it if you want to work a little bit harder than the next guy. If you want to just, like, give your passion over to this thing that matters the most to you, you can make it happen. Like, that's their their belief and so many of their anthems that they share, you know, with the yeah. fans. That's what they want you to believe in yourself and give them money, but also just <laughs> believe in yourself, you know, and, and I think that's a beautiful thing that they've, you know, it's not just me, 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 aren't I awesome? Tell me how awesome I am. It's I, you know, you show that to me all the time and now go do your thing. What's your mark you're going to leave on the world. So I, I think it's awesome that they could, they can project that that most people probably wouldn't imagine that when they see a guy spitting blood or breathing fire. On <laughs> well said, well said. Yeah. So again, Jay, thank you so much uh, for being here. I'm glad we finally got to have this very long conversation. This has been so worth it. Um, no, I, I had a great time. Thanks. And I, there's never a time where, when you said, let's talk about Kiss, of course, I'm always there. T uh, just tell me what time and what aircraft carrier. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so that is, that is the show this time around. But Jay, we mentioned some of your stuff on top. Where do you want people to find you now? Where can they connect with you? Oh, thanks. Yeah, just um, I'm mostly on Instagram uh, at uh, Sludge Central, and you could check out the podcast, Purple Stuff Podcast, uh, and all that great stuff. So, definitely. and hey, Thank give you. them your money. Just yeah, give yeah. Them this ethos. <laughs> Go on over to Patreon. Join the yeah. Patreon. <laughs> yeah. But either way, yeah. Thank you again, and uh, hey, we'll see you later, guys. Thanks so much for checking this out. See ya. This has been a presentation of Geekster Media.